session, uh, software engineering, and cyber physical systems. Please, five minutes. Hello, my name is Ira Kraeva, and I am presenting the study application of metric learning for security incident playbook recommendation. An incident is a breach of a system security policy to affect its integrity or availability. A playbook is a set of actions for managing the aftermath of the incident. The study goal was to propose a method for obtaining playbook recommendation for an incident response. We developed a method based on case-based reasoning, where a case is a set of an incident and the playbooks used for it. When a new incident is detected, similar cases are retrieved from the case base and their playbooks are recommended. We applied a metric learning approach to retaining and retrieving the cases. We used a neural network that maps feature vectors of incident into a Latin space where the incident with similar playbooks are closer together and the similar ones are far apart. This allows us to retrieve the most similar cases using distance metric. This approach is widely used for multi-class classification, but with the incident response, several playbooks can be recommended for one incident. So the task of the playbook recommendation can be considered, considered as multi-label classification. For neural network training, we tried such distance metric as Euclidean distance and cosine similarity. For measuring similarity between cases, we use set similarity metrics. Also, we modified three of the most popular loss functions for metric learning, contrastive loss, triplet loss, and NCA proxy. We trained 20 configurations of the neural network for these different loss functions, distance, and set similarity metrics. As a dataset, we use various community databases with real-world incident data. The results show that some configurations are more effective than others. Then we chose three configurations and compared the quality of the recommendations obtained with the proposed method and the baseline. At the baseline, we used the modification of the method where original descriptions of incident were retained in the case base. The results show that embeddings allow getting more relevant recommendations than original descriptions. We visualized the difference between original descriptions and embeddings with TSNA algorithm. Summing it up, we should say, firstly, the proposed method can be effectively used for the playbook recommendations. Secondly, the quality of the recommendations depends on loss functions, distance and set similarity metrics used for the neural network training. And finally, the metric learning approach allows obtaining more relevant recommendations. Thank you for your attention. You're welcome to ask any questions. What are the questions? Uh... Irina, please repeat, please, the main result of your research. What kind of knowledge uh, uh, you obtain? We proposed the method uh, that can be used in uh, special systems for incident uh, what, management. What kind of method? What, what, what is the essence of the method? Um, this method... Uh, can you describe this method? Uh, we have a database of incident with uh, used for them uh, playbooks. So we uh, use um, neural network for uh, transforming this database into another database uh, of lesser dimensions. And then we um, choose incidents uh, that is similar to the new one for finding the more uh, relative playbooks for, for the new incident. Okay, colleagues. Uh, and uh, who is uh, the target group of your results? Uh, this method was um, developed uh, for, uh, for the product uh, that is used uh, in um, in organizations um, for security what kind management. Of organization? What kind? Uh, it can be any organization that is uh, use some um, incidents uh, management. 
Yes. Please give us some example of uh, such uh, cities. Uh, I'm sure that any organization example, should have. Please, for example, uh, some education organization, for example, well, some kind of uh, example. Please provide. Mm, I think that any can be. Um, Just real. <laughs> example from real life. Just okay, it can be a bank. Life. It can be a bank where a, a security incident happens. Security incident. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, dear colleagues. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, the next uh, talk, uh, Konstantin Antonov, Development and Research of the uh, Convolutional Neural Network for Phenomen uh, uh, Pneumonia Recognition and radi in Radiographs. So it's uh, some kind about COVID, I think. Yes, yes. yes. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Konstantin Antonov, and I'm presenting research and development of the convolutional neural network for pneumonia recognition in radio class. Um, due to the progression of the coronavirus pandemic, tasks related to COVID-19 research uh, are currently becoming urgent. The paper investigates the possibility and effectiveness of using convolutional neural networks for pneumonia recognition in radiographs. At the moment, they and their modifications are considered to be the best algorithms for finding and classifying objects in images, and therefore it has led to the choice of research method. The raw data for the study were taken from the Mendeley data resource. The data set contains 1,321 images of the normal class and 3,875 images of the pneumonia class in JPEG format. For building a neural network was used Python and Keras. As development environment, I use Google Collab. It's a free cloud service that, that provides everything you need for machine learning, including access to GPUs. OpenCV and NumPy were used for, for image processing and Matplotlib for data visualization. This slide shows the architecture of a neural net. Input image has size 200 by 200. It goes through the first convolutional block and it results into a tensor of shape 200 by 200 by 64. 64 is a number of feature maps. They will be shown later. The second convolutional block has a subsampling layer. So the size will be reduced by four. A test out the tensor um, shape will be 100 by 100 by 64. After the third convolutional block, tensor will have say uh, 50 by 50 by 128. And after the fourth, 25 by 25 by 256. Each image was not normalized before training since a large range of feature values in training examples can lead to instability in training. Batch normalization was also used. It is applied to layers of the network for each batch. By using batch normalization, you can achieve faster model convergence. Since there are fewer radiographs of healthy lungs, each such image should be given a higher weight than the radiographs with pneumonia. Also, it was just dropout. It is a method for solving the overfitting problem by excluding neurons from the network with a given probability. The excluded neurons do not contribute to the training process. Convolutional neural networks are invariant to rotation, translation, scaling, and other distortions. So you can take advantage of this and apply, and apply data augmentation. It is a technique of expanding and increasing the variety of the training set by applying random by realistic uh, transformations. The idea behind visualizing future maps is to see which features of the model highlights. We see many versions of the original image with different highlighted features. Some maps highlight lines in the chest, other focus on the abdominal organs, hearts, etc. Feature maps closer to the model inputs highlight many small details and their number decreases as you move deeper into the network. The model abstracts image features into more general concepts that are used for classification. With each new convolutional layer, it becomes more difficult to, to input uh, feature maps, but the neural network highlights the most important features this way. Uh, 
Three methods were used to evaluate the model. Accuracy is a fraction of predictions model got right. It's 0.9. Uh, precision talks about how precise the model is out of those predicted positive, how many of patients actually have pneumonia. It's 0.92. Recall shows how often the model predicts pneumonia when patients actually have illness. It's 0.93. In this task, we want the highest recall possible because it is extremely important to detect the disease. But at the same time, we want to achieve high precision because uh, it is vital for patients to receive treatment. The ROC curve is shown on the left. The area under the curve is 0.96, which indicates reliable recognition of positive class. It is pneumonia. And false alarm is rarely issued. The confusion matrix is shown on the right. Uh, you can see that there are few false predictions. So a convolutional neural network capable of detecting pneumonia with high metric values has been implemented. There's not a lot of training data and there's an imbalanced class distribution. So various approaches have been used to solve the overfitting problem. And it can be conclu concluded that the developed model effectively recognizes pneumonia and can be used in addition to the assessment of qualified radiologists. Thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, thank you for your talk. Dear colleagues, questions. My question is, uh, I see that 90% uh, of the accuracy is very good per uh, rate, a result. So my question is, uh, what about pneumonia? What about uh, differ differentiation, uh, other kind of uh, disease, kind of cancer, kind of emphysema, mm -hmm. emphysema, emphysema. Oh, kind of, uh, there is a lot of uh, disease uh, uh, that look like pneumonia. So what about neural net network? Yeah, uh, you should not uh, expect uh, good results of um, applying other disease to this uh, model because it was trained only on uh, health lungs and pneumonia. So uh, if we provide other data set that has um, um, different classes, other, it, it, uh, other diseases, it we, we could re retrain it uh, yes and please uh, talk a little bit more about data set you use uh, for tuning your neural network mm -hmm. how, how, uh, how many examples and so on and methodology i use the, the data set uh, that contains 1300 images of the normal class and 38 images of the pneumonia class. Uh, it was taken from the, um, from some Chinese hospital of, um, of uh, don't remember the CC, but uh, it's uh, just a trace of uh, children about five years old. Yes, and what uh, uh, and why I see uh, and why uh, uh, only one thousand uh, three hundred image of normal class and uh, about uh, four thousand image of the pneumonia class. Why it's some a little bit non balanced data set do you use can you repeat I mean, I mean if you use mostly only pneumonia data set you maybe can achieve uh, 100 percent recognition why, uh, why do you use not balanced data set uh, it's because uh i found exactly this data set and i tried to um, Mm, to work with this, uh, mm, even though it has imbalance, but uh, it's fixable. You can set a higher class weight to the uh, minor class, and mm, it will show good result anyway. 
So it is possible. It's not a, not a big problem. Okay, thank you. Your colleague's question. Okay, thank you for your talk. Thank you. So the next uh, talk is uh, Nikolai Gervas. Okay, yes, please. Uh, Nikolai Gervas uh, uh, will make talk on the topic platform independent client applications for working with industrial controllers. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, this work considers a system for designing a platform independent graphical interface of programmable logic controllers, uh, next PLC, uh, based on the meta level of describing uh, the structure of PLC registers and graphical interface of control system. Uh, energy storage system, ESS, next. Uh, in container design are complex technological objects. Uh, the local control system of ESS uh, includes a head programmable logic controller uh, that combines data stream from all components, uh, a converter, a storage subsystem, etc. Uh, the PLC hardware and software interface uh, based on the Modbus TCP protocol is a field of uh, registers, including the data source registers, more than 3,000. Um, single and grouped into two and three levels, uh, bit registers, etc. Uh, this slide shows the recommendations, uh, requirements, which were set for the developed monitoring and control system for ESS. And this task can only be solved by creating a full fledged uh, meta level of describing the PLC interface and graphical interface uh, of application. Uh, to the basis of software architecture should be the meta level of description of the system, which includes the description of the PLC interfaces, description of uh, UI applications working with the PLC, uh, description of the streaming data, uh, discrete events, etc. Uh, this slide shows the hardware software architecture of our system. The main component of system is a server that operates in various configurations. Uh, the server includes a database management system, and database, uh, some server data directories uh, for artifact files, uh, server logs, etc., and application data server. Uh, the data server supports a web API, a set of function by which client application receive the necessary services. Uh, web API includes the functions of export and import artifact files, uh, work with the metadata, uh, reading and writing registers, uh, and groups of PLC registers, uh, etc. Uh, the target configuration is the equipment data server. It is connected directly uh, to the PLC or its emulator uh, and has the following functionality. Uh, ensuring the operability of the equipment operator uh, application in local and remote mode, um, collection and accumulation of streaming data, transferring to the main data server, and saving and recording of equipment uh, settings configurations. Uh, the work of the equipment operator can be carried out in several ways. Uh, we are the local kiosk uh, application on equipment server, um, for industrial computer with a touch panel, panel. Uh, desktop uh, application and a separate tab uh, in a full screen mode uh, and we are the remote web application. Uh, this slide shows the example of uh, metadata which is edited in an Excel file. Uh, each type has its uh, own set with a given structure of fields. Uh, then they are imported into database uh, from which the business layer of the data server collects uh, business uh, objects of a tree structure. Uh, the metadata structure is the main part of the domain model. Uh, in the second picture, uh, all meta system uh, of objects have attributes, name, abbreviation, notation. Uh, the PLC interface uh, is a field of registers, uh, single and grouped. A register uh, is characterized by the number and format of uh, data representation, 
bit, uh, 16 bit and unsigned integer, and 32 bit integer and float. Uh, the structure of UI is defined uh, as a form of description. The three structure of screen forms and related controls uh, for metadata has the following attributes, uh, which is shown in slide. Uh, there are about 20 types uh, of control elements, uh, label, command, state indicator, etc. Um, for control in metadata is definite the, its uh, coordinates, size, color, etc. Uh, metadata of all controls is imported from an Excel chat. Uh, is possible the selective use and different interpretation uh, of the same attributes by controls of uh, different types. Uh, for group elements, uh, there are several ways to describe forms and display the hierarchy of the nesting. Uh, there are four types of form for displaying hierarchical data of different levels. Uh, it's shown on slide. Uh, for adequate uh, positioning and on displaying group controls corresponding to group registers in application context, uh, use the two, two stacks. <coughs> it is a current numbers uh, indexes stack uh, of the first element in each level group and dimension stack uh, for each level group. Uh, <coughs> positioning controls uh, element in each level uh, group and dimension uh, work with the data. Uh, it performs operation on specified stacks and use the hints in metadata, uh, current level of group elements and the name of transition form. It's shown on feature on this slide. Uh, all components uh, of server and client application with an uh, exception of web application are developed in uh, Java, which uh, ensures uh, their platform independence. Uh, depending on the configuration, uh, they can run as console and desktop application, uh, as well as a kiosk application. It is a full screen uh, mode. Uh, on this slide shown the web application of this system implemented uh, in TypeScript based on React library. Uh, also for future, I would like to say that uh, this architecture uh, you know, meta level of description can be used for the internet of things. Uh, we have a device metadata and UI metadata. Uh, things uh, read uh, the metadata of device and uh, can use it via the special uh, device driver. Uh, now thing can manage uh, the data streams. A uh, client reads the metadata of UI and display the control elements on screen. Uh, also, we have a persistent server, some uh, that store the streaming data, and all transferring the data happens uh, via the M2M connections. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say that the prototyping results demonstrate that the level of metadata complexity is sufficient to reproduce the functionality of client application working with the PLC uh, with the described uh, interface structure. Uh, and assume that uh, on developing various hardware configurations of equipment uh, reflected in the structure of PLC interface uh, will be required only metadata editing. Uh, in a similar way, uh, the application graphical interface will be changed for different roles of uh, application use. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Listening. Oh. Dear colleagues, because of uh, two uh, absent uh, t talkers, we have speakers, we have ability to speak a little bit more. So we have uh, possibility to ask questions for the, uh, the topic is about industrial automation. Uh, my question is about uh, what, uh, what is uh, comparison of your approach with uh, conventional uh, H HMI uh, interfaces, kind of uh, in touch, for example. Do you know this kind of uh, graphical user interface approach? We have mostly, uh, we have uh, behind TLC, we have some different kind of software, for example, in touch, or maybe 
WinCC and so on, and so on from various uh, uh, producer to provide uh, graphical user interface in the case of industrial automation. So the question is, what is the difference of your pre, uh, approach com uh, comparing to the classical approach? Um, okay. Yeah, uh, the difference uh, in user, the um, platform independent uh, user interface which uh, store presented as uh, metadata, uh, it's used for uh, the PLC structure of data, domain model data, uh, and for user interface. We store uh, data about uh, user interface uh, control elements as in metadata and can use uh, on any device with a specific driver for this device. Okay, but in my opinion, it's mostly the same functionality as use. So, at, uh, about industrial controllers, uh, uh, what kind of, uh, for example, libraries, image libraries do you use? Because when we deal with uh, industrial automation, industrial graphical user interface software, they provide a library of image, for example, for uh, actuators, for sensors, for uh, and so on. Uh, what what uh, what is your proposition? Uh, yeah, in this case, proposals. What is your proposal? In this case, we don't work uh, with the classical graphic um, editing of uh, configuration data for the PLC. Uh, we plan to do it in the future, um, and now I don't have a deep knowledge in the domain uh, model, domain area of uh, the programming logic controllers, uh, and we just uh, have a, let's say, uh, we just have a configuration data. For this, we use our application, which is shown on the slide. Okay, 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 I see. Uh, what kind of language uh, do you plan to use to describe uh, software for industrial controllers? Um, what kind of language do you use? Um, or do you plan to use? As I think, um, uh, Basic same. Well, I, I, I mean, uh, what what about IEC six eleven thirty one part three standard or IEC six uh, forty ninety nine standard? Um, uh, that's that's uh, uh, targets uh, <laughs> directly <laughs> targets to the uh, PLCs and, and so on. Um, so. I don't think about this. Um, I think it's a good idea. But did did you deal with uh, distributed control system? Distributed, mm -hmm. yes, distributed yeah, yeah. control system for the questions of software control. Software specification is very important. It's mainly main, and uh, as to uh, ICC six uh, forty ninety nine standard. There is uh, such a concept as uh, ICC 6 virtual bus. That means you describe, you specify your control algorithm in a central way or application-centric way, but then the algorithms distributed by the hardware in transparent way in some kind of uh, transparent way you need no uh, any any f force any, any any time to think about what what part of control software will be uh, calculated on this plc or this plc or this plc okay. so, so. thank you yeah colleagues
questions? Okay. Thank you, thank you for your great talk. <coughs> so, the following, the next turn is uh, Ivan Chernenko. Proven reflex program verification conditions in COC proof assistant. Ivan, please. Uh, hello. Uh, my name my name is uh, uh, Chernenko Ivan and I uh, would like to uh, present uh, the report uh, proving uh, reflex uh, prog uh, program verification conditions uh, in uh, Coke proof assistant. Uh, hello. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, uh. Uh, this paper uh, presents uh, the results of uh, experiments uh, on proven uh, verification conditions in COC proof assistant uh, within the framework uh, of uh, two-step uh, method of uh, deductive verification uh, of process-oriented programs uh, in uh, reflex language. Uh, next slide. Uh, the pro process-oriented uh, paradigm is a promising approach uh, to the development of uh, control software. Uh, the process-oriented programs are defined as a set of interacting uh, processes. Uh, uh, control software is often safety critical and therefore requires uh, verification. Uh, deductive verification uh, is one of uh, uh, methods of formal verification. Next slide. Uh, Two-step me method of uh, deductive verification for process-oriented uh, language reflex. Uh, in the first uh, step, uh, the annotated uh, reflex uh, pro program is translated uh, into uh, annotated C, C program with uh, limited uh, uh, syntax and in the second step uh, verification conditions are generated uh, for uh, this uh, C programs Next. Um, the main difficulty of uh, deductive verification is uh, pro uh, proven uh, generated verification conditions. Uh, the SMT solver Z3 previously used uh, in the two-step method uh, allowed uh, verifying only simple requirements uh, for uh, control programs, uh, but uh, it uh, co could not cope with uh, uh, more complex requirements, uh, verification conditions for uh, which uh, contained quantifiers and required uh, inductive proof. Next. The COC proof assistant uh, allows uh, uh, proving high-order logic uh, formulas uh, using inductive proof schemes and using uh, arrays. The uh, hand uh, uh, control program Next. Yes. Uh, consists of uh, one uh, pro process uh, with two states waiting uh, for hands and drying. Uh, next. Uh, we verify mm, uh, following uh, requirements uh, for this program. Uh, for example, uh, the fan heater should turn on uh, in reasonable time. Uh, 
Next slide. Formal annotation. This is the formal annotations for the first requirement. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, this one of uh, uh, in, uh, verification conditions for the uh, first requirements. Uh, next. Uh, and this is the uh, proof uh, in uh, this is proof in Coke proof assistant. Uh, next slide. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we propose uh, a new method uh, of uh, proving verification conditions uh, uh, for process-oriented programs uh, using Coke Proof Assistant. We apply uh, this method uh, to uh, for verifying uh, the requirements uh, for uh, and dry uh, control program. Uh, all uh, verification uh, conditions for the uh, first four requ requirements uh, have been uh, proven. We also ha have proved uh, that uh, the fifth requirement is false. Uh, uh, these uh, requirements is, uh, are uh, typical for white cl white class of uh, process oriented programs. Uh, therefore, uh, proposed method is uh, quite general. Thank you for attention. Thank you for attention. Dear colleague, questions, please. I have questions. Uh, what is the difference between uh, the three uh, uh, prover and uh, the cock you use? Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Why why cock? Why not the three? Uh, like it, that, it that was three before. Is a, a SMT solver. Uh, it, uh, 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 so, uh, so uh, for uh, logical formulas, uh, we uh, qu quantify it, and uh, also for POC, uh, uh, allows uh, uh, is using induction, uh, induction uh, need in this uh, uh, work. I mean, from the point of view of requirements of the program, uh, so does uh, Z three allow to prove all the requirements? Mm. What what three requirements for the Condrive program? One, two, three, four, five. The fan heater. Is it possible to prove uh, this requirement with Z three uh, proof? Uh, what, what? Some uh, uh, requirements uh, is it possible to verify all all these requirements uh, with the three? Uh, all requirement uh, no all require uh, we uh, can't uh, verify all requirements uh, using all, only uh, that three. Uh, why? Why? On, on what kind of requirements you can uh, you cannot verify by by the three? Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, third requirements uh, third. when uh, the uh, if the hands uh, are removed, the fan uh, heater will turn off after no more than one second. If hands do not 
reappear during this time. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and what? Before, no? um, uh, uh, such requirements, uh, uh, we agreed um, uh, uh, that when uh, quantified, uh, when uh, well, uh, uh, requirements um, about uh, time, uh, tem temporal uh, uh, requirement properties, uh, uh, we need uh, using uh, induction. Ah, we need using induction. Okay, uh, what, what about uh, coke? Ah, so, so coke provides induction properties, so you, so it make possible, yes? So all these requirements, you, you uh, proof all the requirements, well, not, not proof, but, but five, you uh, prove that is, uh, there is contradiction between requirements number five, yes? And yes. Uh, and uh, 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 with what requirements number five contradicts? contradicts? Uh, number five requirements number contradicts five with, requirements with what kind? What is the number of requirements? Uh, the number uh, five contradicts. Contradicts. Uh, um, use uh, use uh, uh, proof uh, contradict of uh, verification uh, conditions for uh, uh, re requirement number five. Ah, ah, okay. The control algorithms are what is control. Oh, I've lost the delete. Maybe some problem with power supply. Okay, okay, okay. Dear colleagues, questions? Unique possibility to uh, uh, to ask some questions with specialists we in uh, deductive verification techniques of control software. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. <coughs> so the next talk is uh, uh, Alexander Peshkov. Alexander Peshkov. Uh, development and research of multi-factor ensemble models for forecasting the time series of electricity prices. Or okay, thank you. Uh, let's go. Okay, uh, forecasting the price of electricity in the uh, so-called uh, day ahead market uh, is currently an uh, urgent task in the in connection with the formation of uh, sale uh, electricity and the capacity market uh, in Russia. Uh, the price in a uh, given market is a uh, moving hourly time series. Uh, uh, now this task is solved uh, at the uh, Novosibirsk hydropower plant by the Department of Energy uh, Market Support, uh, which acts uh, as a customer of this, this work. Uh, there is a need to develop uh, effective algorithms and uh, appropriate software for the uh, more accurate forecast of future prices uh, in order to uh, efficiently and uh, and profitably profitably uh, sell electricity next slide please okay uh, to solve this problem uh, this work uh, proposes uh, the use of uh, ensemble approach uh, which has uh, proven itself well in the field of data processing 
uh, for all uh, its effectiveness, uh, the ensemble idea is very simple and uh, and is based on uh, on combining uh, single predictions uh, in the fundamental work. Uh, of Bates and Granger, uh, it was uh, mat mathematically shown uh, that uh, combining the results of several forecasts allows allows one uh, to uh, allows uh, to reduce uh, the variance of forecast errors, uh, provided uh, and provided that uh, the for single forecast errors are uncorrelated. Uh, that means single forecasts give uh, errors that are different in the uh, sign and uh, different in magnitude. Uh, to build ensemble models, the the following set of single models was selected. Was selected. Uh, vector is exponential smoothing. Uh, a Remax multi-factor version of uh, or the Arima and the model Prothet uh, is uh, additive regression models from Facebook company. Uh, heterogeneous ensembles are composed of previously described models. Among such models, uh, non-linear optimization model, uh, model of polyny polynomial potential aggregation, and the uh, model uh, by simple averaging. Uh, now some words uh, about each ensemble model. Uh, to integrate uh, the results of forecasts of basic models, a nonlinear optimization algorithm was applied to determine uh, of the, to determine uh, the the combination coefficient, uh, the total RMSE error on the on the training set. Uh, is used uh, uh, an uh, objective function. Uh, next, uh, ML poly algorithm calculates the final forecasting is a weighted average of single forecast use uh, polynomial weights. Uh, a feature of this model is the time wearing uh, weights of the base models. And uh, simple average model assigns the uh, same weights to all baseline forecasts are resulting in uh, in, in uh, arithmetic uh, mean. Uh, okay, uh, this slide shows the test part of sample uh, of a time series of electricity prices with a overlay of uh, multivariate uh, models. Uh, then, uh, then take into account uh, five main. Uh, Mm, factors that affect the price of electricity. And uh, this slide shows a table with uh, indicators of the accuracy of the model on the test sample. Uh, in terms of the coefficient of determination, the best we are ensemble multifactor heterogeneous models, namely uh, the nonlinear optimization uh, and the model based on polynomial weights. Uh, based on the total forecast error, which can be estimated uh, using the RMSE, uh, the model uh, based on polynomial weights is the best. Uh, okay. Uh, the architecture of a software system implements the MVC pattern. Uh, one of the feature of the program uh, is the use of two programming languages, uh, R, uh, R and Java. Uh, the four special attention uh, is paid to the uh, to the middle layer uh, that calls R code from Java. Uh, for this, the program uses uh, three type of uh, interface, uh, R surfer, R crawler, and the R engine. Uh, the, main vi the main window of the program is shown on the slide. The program implements the ability to uh, download data from the Husserl electricity and capacity market. Uh, 
at the spe specified uh, interval. Uh, the downloaded data automatically convert to the time series and uh, displayed graphically. Uh, next, forecasting models are selected uh, and the information about the time series and the values of accuracy indicators on the test sample uh, is displayed. Uh, Uh, I'd like to finish by emphasizing uh, the main points. Uh, ensemble predictive models uh, have shown themselves uh, to be more efficient than single forecasting methods in uh, almost all accuracy characteristics. Uh, and uh, uh, using, uh, the, using the example of the time series of electricity prices, uh, the advantage uh, of using the ensemble approach for generating a short-term forecasting uh, is shown. Uh, and uh, as a result of this work, software was developed for forecasting, predicting electricity prices uh, using various ensemble algorithms. Uh, and uh, this program also has the ability to load user data uh, therefore, it can be used to predict any time series. Thanks for your attention. Dear colleagues, what questions about prediction of electricity prices? <laughs> it's very, it's, uh, <laughs> it's for me very strange because I uh, cannot recall when Electricity prices fall down at all. It's mostly. Yes, 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 please. Question. Please, microphone. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Or not? One, two, three. Akpash Fuslan, Sipsutis. Is there already a commercial product or will it be? If not. Uh. This program uh, uh, was sent o uh, to state registration on patent. Oh, okay, and the second question, if it's okay for everybody else. Uh, did you think to add not just an electricity, but to, to make sort of aggregation application for water, for everything else, not just for electricity? You know, for, for example, as the Yandex do, they have Yandex Market where there are a lot of products they aggregating the prices and didn't you think to do the same? I think it will be much better, for example. Thank you. Uh, the task of uh, forecasting uh, Electricity price forecasting is uh, difficult and uh, it has many uh, mm, features uh, uh, links the Russian uh, capacity market and uh, maybe uh, Software from Yandex uh, don't uh, don't work good with uh, this uh, specified data. Uh, for Yandex Market, uh, I don't have uh, examples. Uh, I I uh, use the uh, Profet model. Uh, it's not Yandex, but it's uh, Facebook. <laughs> I'm such satisfied. <laughs> yes, thank you. What, well, my question is about what uh, do you think what will happen if 
uh, everybody will use your software on the market. What happen? What will happen if everybody will use your software? Uh, this software don't use uh, by everybody. By everybody, I, I, I mean who need this software, who, who buy electricity. Uh, what will happen if uh, everybody who, who this, buy electricity? This software is yes. provided information uh, by, by who sell electricity. Who sell? Yes. Yes. Slightly I modify my question. What will happen if everybody who sell the electricity will use your software? What will happen? Well, maybe happen averaging uh, uh, prices, uh, but uh, this software uh, uh, is point uh, on our Novosibirsk Skidder power station, not all power station. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, questions? Okay, I, I think hear that it will be some, some big problem if everybody, uh, according to your software, will uh, think that... Uh, everybody uh, uses <laughs> software for forecast uh, itself uh, data. Okay, you thank can, you. You can load any data in time series for... Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. To our next speaker is uh, ah, dear colleagues, Andrei uh, Sherbin asked us uh, to allow him make his talk. Yes. 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 Can you yes. hear? Andrei Sherbin, Gaussian based active learning algorithm for image classification problem please in my presentation i will uh, told you about uh, active learning what is it uh, formalize my task of active learning and uh, tell you about uh, classical approaches and gaussian based approach uh, after that i will uh, show some benchmarks and uh, told about future research let's start Active learning is a process where we can, we have uh, some labeled data, some uh, model uh, which uh, approximate this data, and some unlabeled data pool. Uh, and uh, uh, the task is from unlabeled data pool for uh, maximum increase of uh, model uh, accuracy. Uh, on some uh, test set. Uh, for label, we have some oracle. Uh, it may be a person or some environment. We may, uh, we may uh, make experiments for getting uh, results for unlabeled data. And we add data to label a data pool and uh, retrain our model. Uh, more formal, we can say that we have a uh, labeled data set with uh, n samples, and label a data pool with m samples, and we can we uh, can specify k uh, the budget for labeling uh, number of samples which we can uh, label. Uh, and uh, as output, we want to get uh, label a data set with uh, n plus k samples and uh, learned model with maximum possible quality. Uh, in classical approaches, uh, there are uh, least confidence. Uh, then we uh, sample uh, examples with minimum highest confidence of our model, uh, margin sampling. Uh, then we uh, sample examples based on uh, margin uh, between two uh, the most uh, confidence classes and maximum entropy when we uh, count Shannon's entropy uh, and uh, 
on on model co confidences and uh, sample examples with the most entropy. Uh, our hypotheses are uh, uh, values in each coordinate in the internal hidden representation of deep uh, neural networks is from Gaussian distribution. And uh, we uh, think that uh, multiplication of likelihood uh, values over coordinates shows uh, uh, the likelihood for sample. So our algorithm is uh, estimate mean and variance uh, from each coordinate in the neural network hidden representation. It calls embedding uh, on validation part of data set for each class. Uh, after that, compute Gaussian function as a value of likelihood for each class uh, on each coordinate. Uh, after that, sample uh, the most likelihood samples for each class and rank it uh, using some confidence-based method. Uh, I told about it uh, late uh, in classical approach overview. And uh, add top K samples to training set. Uh, so we benchmark our approach on a mini ImageNet task. Uh, it, is it, is, it is image classification task uh, with 20 random classes from ImageNet um, data set. Uh, we boost the quality of uh, classical approaches by uh, Gaussian filtering. Uh, we can see it on this plot. Uh, after that, we, uh, ah, in the previous uh, example, we uh, use the first model, uh, model on, on the first step, 10% uh, uh, of data using for training. Uh, based on this model, we uh, uh, count uh, the efficiency of uh, samples. Uh, in the second experiment, we use a model from previous step. And so then you, when we uh, sample data between, uh, sample 30% of data, we use model that, uh, that train it of 20% of data. Uh, in the conclusion, our approach improves the results of confidence-based methods. Uh, and adding more samples increase the difference between our approach and uh, confidence-based methods. Any questions? Thank you. So, questions, dear colleagues? Colleagues, questions, yes, please. Microphone. Is very similar with some current uh, reinforcement method or semi supervised method. So, what's your uh, innovation ideas in your, your current method? Mm, our innovation is using Gaussian filtering uh, for confidence based active learning methods. And what is the result? Practical value. Uh, I can't hear. Can you speak in the microphone? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, question, what practical value of your innovation? Uh, they can uh, improve the quality of machine learning based uh, applications uh, and uh, decrease the cost of uh, data labeling. Okay, thank you. What is the question from neural network community? Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. start uh, the talk of Professor Vyatkin about uh, problems and perspectives that we face in the context of Industry 4. Professor Vyatkin, please. Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. My name is Valerie Vyatkin. I'm a professor at Alta University in Finland and uh, also at uh, Lule University of Technology in Sweden. And I'm uh, a co-director of a research laboratory and professor at Itmo University in St. Petersburg in Russia. And today I'm going to talk about uh, cyber physical engineering concepts in the context of Industry 4.0. Uh, Industry 4.0 implies uh, that we are talking about uh, industrial automation, most of all, and this is my area of research and my area of interest. Um, so what is industrial automation? I put on screen some examples uh, of industrial automation processes uh, in this video. So you see uh, pretty versatile examples uh, from car manufacturing, uh, from food manufacturing. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, there is a, a airport baggage handling system, highly automated. And uh, in the bottom uh, right slide, there is a substation, electrical substation that distributes energy uh, to uh, uh, consumers. Uh, so all of these systems, uh, even though they are quite different, uh, they are automated uh, using kind of very similar hardware, very similar software. And uh, despite the uh, discrepancies and differences in, in their organization, uh, automation of all this is facing very similar challenges. So, This is just to set the context. Uh, what is um, this? What is this approach is to automation? What is a state of the art uh, in programmable automation? Uh, typically, um, whatever industrial object we automate, we use uh, devices which are called programmable logic controllers. So these are uh, very specific industrial computers. Uh, that connected, sometimes they connected to sensors and actuators of our factory directly with electrical wires. But in most cases these days, they are connected uh, with uh, different uh, computer networks. So uh, all this data from uh, the factory uh, get into programmable logic controllers and uh, get processed there. So the software is running there. And this software is written in some very weird programming languages uh, from a computer scientist perspective, like uh, the one uh, on screen is a lot of diagram language. Uh, nevertheless, these languages are widely, widely used by the practitioners. And um, uh, once uh, the results of the program is calculated, uh, the Output values are sent via computer networks back to uh, actuators which are located within the machines. So 
so that's in nutshell what what is a uh, hardware and software uh, state of the art and this uh, implies uh, this kind of organization uh, implies what is called uh, pyramid uh, ict pyramid of automation which uh, divides uh, all the information communication technologies in the factory flow into such a pyramid view um, starting with a lower level of sensors and ending up with a enterprise level business logic on top so implementation of this programmable logic control uh, has resulted and has uh, um, kind of uh, motivated development of very specific model of computations. Actually, uh, all these computational processes in PLCs, they happen in very fast, uh, very short time intervals called scans. So in each of the scans, uh, input values from sensors uh, collected and uh, sampled, uh, copied into memory, then the main program is executed uh, and then outputs are uh, transmitted back uh, through output ports to actuators and this happens uh, in this scan intervals uh, very very frequently uh, like typical duration of um, this scan interval could be a few milliseconds in some cases it could go down to microseconds depending on the requirements of the process so so this model of computation is known as a synchronous model of computations in general. And it has a very nice properties, which uh, explain why this model of computation is applied uh, for decades and decades uh, in the area, uh, which are determinism, reliability, in case of uh, any sensor glitches and uh, there is an error, uh, the correct value will be restored very quickly. Uh, and as a result, uh, that results in, in kind of deterministic behavior when uh, same output signals are generated uh, given the same input data. But uh, their requirement, of course, that this, all these assumptions are true if the scan time is very short. So, uh, on the other hand, in the title of my talk, I use the word cyber physical systems and cyber physical engineering. And uh, we talk a lot about cyber physical systems lately. And I tell you, I tell you the truth, I'm not a big fan of, of this wording, cyber physical systems. I first of all, I don't understand what is cyber physical systems. And uh, because I don't really understand what people mean, people mean different things, different time. I want to, together with you, a little bit investigate what is cyber physical systems and where does uh, this uh, combination of words come from and what is, uh, does it actually mean? So uh, another buzzword in my title of my talk is this industry 4.0 and then uh, dates back to the German initiative, uh, Industry 4.0, uh, so which was uh, uh, proposed uh, like about a decade ago as a solution, as a as a solution to the challenge. And the challenge was that the manufacturing is kind of leaving industrialized countries uh, and is going to uh, some other parts of the world and uh, with an attempt to, br uh, to bring back the leadership of uh, industrial countries in, in that sector, uh, they propose this initiative as a fourth industrial uh, revolution. And uh, as a foundation for this fourth industrial revolution, it was envisaged like two main pillars. Uh, which are Internet of uh, Things technology and cyber physical systems. So at that moment of time, uh, 
uh, this uh, combination of words cyber physical system has become widely used by uh, the practitioners and researchers in uh, the area of industrial automation. Uh, so still uh, that combination of words sounds pretty strange and uh, I try to go to literature and to find out what how, how do people in this domain in industrial automation systems how do they understand how do they define uh, what cyber physical systems actually does mean so so there are some uh, publications uh, by good colleagues of mine uh, uh, in some very high profile journals which are trying to manipulate with these words and uh, one of such definitions I took from this paper in Proceedings of IEEE, uh, which says that uh, cyber physical entity integrates hardware function with cyber representation. And uh, then says that CPS combines two worlds, embedded systems and cloud systems. Embedded systems are exhibiting real-time and strictly deterministic behavior, while cloud systems are highly probabilistic and optimized behavior without firm time constraints. Okay, so I picture myself like a combination of embedded system and the cloud system is equal to CPS. Mm, maybe. Any other uh, ideas? Uh, Yes, uh, I found another paper with the partially same authors, which defined the cyber physical system slightly different. They say it's a network of cyber and physical elements, CPS control and monitor real world physical infrastructure. Uh, so basically, uh, following this definition, interface. Uh, like a network of uh, cyber and physical elements, I picture myself some production line, uh, which of course has a network of cyber and physical elements. But then I'm asking myself, uh, like is this modular production line, uh, is it a cyber physical system? And if it is, uh, what made it such? Like uh, it, uh, 20 years back, it was just a modular production line. And then after announcement of industry 4.0, it became cyber physical system. Uh, for, what, for which reason? What, what actually uh, is a new quality which uh, requires us to call it differently? So in some other publication, I found this definition, cyber physical systems are engineered solutions obtained through the seamless integration of computational algorithms and physical components. So here I picture myself algorithms, then physical components. Like if I take a pneumatic valve, a pneumatic uh, the cylinder, a typical pneumatic cylinder from uh, Festo that are used widely in uh, machines. So I take this physical component, I take algorithm. Does it make cyber physical system? Um, it's a bit contrary definition. So my observation is that according to these definitions, which I find in the kind of industry 4.0 related literature and automation literature, uh, almost anything around us is a cyber physical system. Uh, then the question is why do we need to use uh, this combination of words? Uh, what is a what what is the value of such definition? What is a what is a point? Uh, do we really uh, um, need it? If if it can determine like anything around us. So in a quest towards understanding what where does this story come from, I did a little bit of digging and talking to to some uh, experts in the field. And I found, I think I found some roots of where 
where this wording cyber physical system comes from. Um, yeah, it's a well known story, and there is this uh, famous paper by uh, Radha Kisan and Jill, uh, the impact of control in the, in the impact of control technology from 2011. Uh, and the story dates back to DARPA seminar at uh, which uh, DARPA attempted to bring together uh, people from two different camps, from computer science camp and uh, from uh, control systems camp. And uh, at that seminar, this a big uh, gap between these two camps has become very clear. Uh, so while computer scientists, they are live in the ivory tower of uh, investigating uh, pure computational uh, uh, phenomena and uh, uh, properties of, of systems and they call the rest uh, the environment. Uh, the control engineers, uh, they are focused on representing world as a kind of models uh, based on differential equations. And they trust that when they put these differential equations into computer, Computer just will the result. It's it's a trivial thing. Uh, the real thing is to solve differential equations. So according to this uh, explanation in the paper uh, by Radha Kishan and uh, Jill, uh, cyber physical uh, system research aims to integrate knowledge and engineering principle across these two camps, computational engineering disciplines. Uh, including electrical, mechanical, chemical, biomedical, uh, to develop new cyber physical science and supporting technology. So, uh, the authors of that uh, paper highlight that each representation used in the eyes of uh, classical sciences, like computer science or control science. So they highlight like certain features and disregard others. Uh, but this is a problem if we want to solve really new complex uh, problems where these two intertwined uh, very, very tightly. Uh, we need to develop new formalisms and new theories where uh, both cyber and physical processes are equally and adequately represented because the existing ones do not have this property. So this is a goal of new cyber physical science. Um, in uh, another work by Edward uh, Lee from Berkeley, I found also a very interesting observation about uh, components at any level of abstraction should be made predictable and reliable. So that's a goal of cyber physical science eventually to uh, ensure that uh, these combinations behave predictably and reliably and the whole systems composed of, of, of the such components are also behave predictably and reliably. Uh, and that may require uh, exercising like going to next level of abstraction uh, to uh, compensate with robustness at the next level of abstraction. For example, if we use wireless uh, communication links, so we need to do some compensation uh, with more reliable protocols. But not only that, we can also investigate the reasons why these wireless links are not uh, predictable, what makes them such, and uh, can we kind of estimate and predict these impacts from the physical world. So, uh, and this makes me kind of uh, thinking about cyber physical system uh, concept as uh, uh, having two distinctive, distinctive features. Unlike embedded systems, CPS models include physical process model, but un unlike control series, CPS models take into account the semantics of real computing system. So at least these two ingredients need to be uh, combined in order to uh, really approach complex cyber physical problems. And 
from investigated literature, to me, it becomes clear that there are two, two different things. One is a set of supporting technologies. And this, this includes embedded systems, different approaches to software development, cloud technologies, service-oriented architecture, just to ex exemplify a few. So these new uh, beasts make uh, the world of very complicated world of technologies. And this perhaps is what is typically in automation uh, referred as cyber physical systems. But in addition to that, there is a there is a new science, which is, I think, totally omitted in the publications of industrial automation people. And this new science should be aiming at the goal of making such systems based on supporting technologies working in a predictable and robust manner. And this brings me to the concept of cyber physical engineering. So in my view, in industrial automation, to summarize, the word cyber physical systems, just meaningless. So these just substitute set of technologies which are uh, which I appear and use. Uh, so if we really want to fill it with the content, we need to add the cyber physical science and convert it into cyber physical engineering. So one interesting phenomena that really requires this view is the existence of some cross influences between physical systems and cyber systems. So like the simplest cyber physical system uh, that we could imagine would combine at least two computers connected to a network and both connected to the physical world somehow, through sensors and actuators, for example, or maybe even indirectly, like submerged into some physical environment and experiencing uh, some influence like a temperature, for example. So, so these entities, they influence each other. Computers influence physical system by, you know, actuating it, but on the other hand, of course, physical system influences computers by providing changing values of sensors, but not only that. Uh, like imagine that we control a motor via wireless link and the physical system, which is a motor, emits electromagnetic field. And this electromagnetic field uh, disrupts uh, networking. Uh, and uh, if we transfer sensory data through the network, the faster motor rotates, uh, the more network may be disrupted. And then uh, how to uh, model this and how to uh, kind of predict uh, at which uh, speed we will lose the control quality. So this kind of phenomena make it uh, really interesting to investigate. And what is more interesting is that we develop software and we put software into computers. What we want to do is, despite all this uh, sometimes unpredictable, sometimes predictable influences, we want to keep software running in a kind of robust way. So we don't want to change software every time uh, we discover a new kind of uh, physical influence or cross influence. So we want, during the process of system design and commissioning, take these cyber physical effects into account and result in the software that we kind of agnostic uh, to uh, uh, this possible uh, cross influences. So that could be a decent goal of cyber physical engineering in industrial automation. And as an example of uh, uh, such systems, which are highly uh, challenging to design, I could uh, present uh, this uh, uh, swarm of drones uh, that were used at uh, Olympics of 2018 at the opening of uh, Olympic Games um, to form different uh, structures in the air. And you can uh, guess uh, how challenging it is to, uh, to design such a system and what sort of cross influences uh, could be uh, observed and explored uh, by, by those uh, communicating drones. But if we come to from this exciting world of uh, swarming drones to industrial automation, 
what are the motivations in the automation world? Do we have similar challenges in automation? Uh, and I could name a few. Like, uh, first obvious motivations uh, in the industrial automation world is the presence of distributed computations and wireless communications. Uh, so why? Why do we need wireless communication in the factory floor? Because it enables flexibility. So uh, why do we need flexibility? Here are some examples of uh, which um, impose a need for flexibility. Um, so we see here in this video uh, some results of a project on uh, a smart uh, shoe, shoe production that were done in Europe uh, in the past decade. And they were to implement a new business model in which a shoe were manufactured to order uh, being uh, cut for a particular uh, fit shape of the customer, which is uh, scanned in, with a 3D scanner. Uh, so, and then the fully robotic uh, facility manufactures uh, uh, these shoes. Uh, so, to implement this uh, production to all the concept, a completely new production line structure was developed. And this slide is showing uh, this uh, research facility in uh, Milan. Italy, which was built to implement this production to other concept. In that we will see that the layout of this production line is composed of such uh, modules, such as cells composed of uh, same kind of machines. And uh, this architecture uh, provides the required flexibility because every next pair of product going, to, uh, going through this production line, unlike in the conveyor line, uh, will have a different path and different set of operations. And even layout of this factory uh, would be changing uh, during its operation. So that implies the machines must be smart enough and uh, have some embedded control and some kind of brains to be easily dockable to each other. So this concept uh, starts working already in the practice. And uh, we know now that uh, there are uh, such uh, customized shoe manufacturing facilities. Uh, for example, Adidas has already deployed and uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, it is a reality and you can find in some shopping malls in Europe, uh, such shops where you can go, scan your feet and uh, order customized uh, uh, sport shoes and get them in a matter of like one hour. So, so this concept is uh, slowly uh, moving into the practice and that implies a changing of uh, the ICT architecture. So now we are talking, instead of talking about pyramid as it is a state of the art, we are talking about the internet of machines where smart machines are communicating one with another. Uh, so, and uh, main promise of this ICT architecture is a flexibility, ease of reconfiguration, uh, robustness, and adaptability. So we are thinking of uh, factory flow that is changing all the time through the lifetime of the system and composed of such uh, smart machines can uh, uh, be integrated into different uh, configurations based on the changing requirements to the product. So in our laboratory at Lula University of Technology, for example, we are playing with some of uh, this modularity and uh, smart production technologies. Uh, so this video shows just uh, uh, some of such production uh, processes, which are, uh, what is interesting about that, it's, it's uh, really peer-to-peer -peer collaboration of different machines, which are, uh, quite smart and uh, controlled with uh, their uh, own control systems. At our research lab at Alta University, we experiment with mobile robots and other machines being put on, on such uh, AGV platforms and form uh, production floors uh, from such dynamic, uh, dynamically reconfiguring entities. But when we come to 
uh, model of computation uh, that is uh, still dominating in the factory and it is based on the synchronous model of computation. Here we come to a problem. So in this example, I have uh, a small experiment when I have two pneumatic cylinders over here. And these two pneumatic cylinders are controlled by two PLCs. And the PLCs are connected to the network. So this kind of architecture is implemented using the existing IEC 61131 standard in the program team uh, structure text language. So we see that these two PLCs are exchanging uh, information and coordinate the activity using shared variables, which is the dominating mechanism for, for exchange of, of uh, data. So when we uh, put this into simulation environment, we can uh, see that this uh, kind of distributed system can uh, be tested and we see that it works as expected. But then we apply a, a little improvement to the system. So we model the improvement by uh, speeding up, accelerating one of the PLCs, changing its reaction time, changing its scan cycle from 100 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. And then we restart the same system, same exactly the same without any uh, change in the, in the software. Uh, we restart it and we see that it starts working uh, again, uh, uh, apparently kind of correct. Uh, but then suddenly something happens and, and uh, correct behavior stops and it starts working incorrectly. So what happened? So th there we see uh, the impact uh, um, and uh, the fragility of this uh, synchronous model of computation when it is applied to distributed systems. In distributed systems, we uh, cannot be uh, reliant on uh, exchange of shared variables, some uh, other mechanisms are required. Uh, so to model such distributed worlds composed of heterogeneous components with different dynamics, uh, there have been many attempts and uh, uh, some remarkable attempts, uh, for example, development of the Ptolemy uh, two modeling environment uh, at Berkeley. Uh, which is a semantic framework for distributed cyber physical systems uh, in which you can represent both physical world and the computational parts and uh, uh, experiment with different models of computations which are event driven, timestamp based or purely synchronous model of computation. So uh, it's equivalent uh, in the industrial automation world is uh, the model introduced by the new standard called IEC 61499. And uh, this model is based on the concept of software components connected with event uh, and data flow. And this is equivalent uh, to um, uh, passing messages uh, between uh, software components. And this model of computation allows us uh, to uh, uh, become to make software in an independent way uh, from uh, the hardware. Uh, so we can uh, get away from uh, such a dependency and uh, such a fragility of our software uh, when it comes to its deployment in distributed system because the foundation of, uh, of, of, of that is equivalent to uh, like message passing in networks. As, a, as, a, as an example of operating system with uh, multiple controllers, I can show you uh, a system uh, we developed with 10 wireless PLCs based on this IEC 61499 standard. So it's a prototype of production line, uh, which changes its layout uh, during the operation and is totally based on the distributed uh, logic. Okay, and, and its uh, software is developed uh, using this IEC 61499 uh, component approach with uh, components deployed to these 10 nano PLCs uh, communicating wirelessly. Okay, so this one application combines 
uh, operation technologies, information technologies, internet of things and digital twin. And it's still robust to different uh, environmental uh, disturbances and changes. So let me summarize in the end uh, what I uh, kind of propose. I propose to, um, instead of cyber physical systems, talk about cyber physical engineering. And there are some characteristic features of cyber physical uh, engineering, which are making computations distribution ready, uh, make uh, it ready to uh, using uh, artificial intelligence by applying multi-agent architectures, machine learning, neural networks. Also use design documents from the physical world to generate software. Uh, wide use of physical system models at all stages of system design. And uh, that implies the need of new cyber physical formal languages that are capable of capturing uh, efficiently properties of both physical world and cyber world. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Your question, please. Okay, please. I have a question um, about uh, your last slide. You mentioned about the cyber power uh, to create and validate models. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, well, um, one example. One example, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, simulation models around, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we also, uh, sometimes uh, we need, in order to build formal models of our systems, uh, like formal models of processes, uh, so we use formal languages such as state machines, you know, finite state machine language or Petronet language, right? But somebody needs to create these models in order to, to benefit from using those formal models in a closed loop setup with models of, of the controller. We need, we need to build them manually. And this is a, a hard and uh, error prone process. Why don't to use uh, existing data describing behavior of existing systems or simulation models that exist in abundance sometimes, but uh, used for different purposes. So one approach that been explored, uh, you know, not very recently that it has some history is to record uh, the traces of data coming from uh, either real objects or from the simulation models. And based on these traces, uh, create uh, finite state machines, for example, right? So this is, is, is known as learning finite state machines from a data, from a data-based models. So that requires huge computational power in order to, uh, you know, assemble those finite state machines from recorded data. That's what I meant by using cyber power to create and validate models. And validate means apply uh, you know, such uh, methods as a model checking, which again uh, requires a lot of computational power. So I see here uh, like the use of cyber power to create models of physical systems as a feature of cyber physical engineering. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I have so, so uh, I have questions about uh, maybe our one, one of our sponsors sponsors of this conference is Huawei worldwide leader in telecommunicating system corporation it's leading corporation so the question is uh, can we uh, uh, sounds your opinion about connection concept of the cyber physical system or the industry for the zero to the telecommunicating system is it uh, some class of uh, uh, cyber physical system or it is a, a kind of separate area or, or what please no i, I that's 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 uh, that's 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 all that's also an excellent question and uh, that's that that's actually it's happening uh, like these days that all the giants 
in telecom industry like Huawei, Nokia and Ericsson, uh, they all uh, in their agendas, uh, research agendas, they include industry 4.0 as, as one of the targets. And uh, we, I, I was showing uh, this uh, example for, uh, of, of um, a small production line based on nano PLCs. We are now working with the next generation of these devices, which will have 5G connectivity. And we have already in, in, in both my labs in Finland and in Sweden, we have 5G access points already installed uh, for, for indoor use and connecting uh, the devices with, uh, with uh, 5G instead of Wi-Fi. So telecom is coming to the factory floor very, very uh, actively and uh, is also experimenting, telecom giants experimenting with different uh, computational models uh, using more of a cloud uh, paradigm. Uh, now it's it's uh, like primarily in the cloud or at the edge. Uh, we put uh, computationally hungry uh, functions such as machine learning, for example. But uh, one can think also of a purely telecom-like uh, uh, approach when the end devices, which embedded into, um, you know, these machines, they are responsible for just data collection, sensory measurement, and then, uh, you know, uh, connected to the cloud where the program actually is executed. This is what uh, I, I call telecom model of, of uh, like automation. And it's, it's being actively investigated uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, all the telecom giants are involved in um, this kind of industry for the zero activities. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, a question? Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Professor Palchinov, please. Professor Palchinov. Uh, do you listen to me? Yes. 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 We hear you. Yes. Well, uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I have a uh, following question: If we consider such complicated system as, for example, Buran, uh, spacecraft Buran, uh, produced under supervision by Lazin Lazinsky, which uh, fly came back exactly in the place, a uh, certain place and it was so just self-controlled. Do you consider mm -hmm. this uh, aircraft as, a, as an example of cyber-physical system or not? Uh, and what, if, it's not, if not, what yeah. is the difference? Yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for this excellent uh, and very uh, inspiring uh, pitch uh, you know, towards Buran. Uh, well, actually, to the best of my understanding of, of the problems that need to be solved in order to, 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 to make Buran happen, a lot of uh, cyber physical uh, system effects uh, need to be taken into account. And as you know, the first launch of uh, Energia uh, Booster uh, was uh, unsuccessful exactly on the reason, for the reason of not taking of not not employing of some of their uh, newly coming cyber physical engineering methods into account. As you know, you know that the problem that happened and uh, uh, that was, uh, to the best of my knowledge, due to just insufficient testing of software. Uh, on the other hand, a system like Buran is, is a classic example of where classic cyber physical system science need to be applied. But the backside of Buran is, is for example, the launching pad and the, the fueling system, uh, you know, with, with this cryogenic uh, uh, fueling system with uh, combining hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and I, in my early, um, early research life, I was involved in, into, into some work related to uh, automation of, of that fueling system. 
Uh, and I see uh, even in that part, uh, uh, a lot of cyber physical engineering, um, you know, opportunities to apply the concepts of cyber physical engineering because uh, the system of that scale with the thousands and tens of thousands of inputs and outputs uh, was extremely hard to debug and, uh, uh, you know, maintain and made, made, make, make it running uh, to, to the deadline. Uh, have I answered your question? Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I understand. Thank you, thank you. So, dear colleagues, uh, one more question. Uh, would you like Professor uh, Vyatkin to list some challenging problem in uh, field of verification of the cyber physical system? Firstly, uh, I mean uh, some techniques to fight against uh, so-called complexity explosion problem that appears because of parallelism of the calculation uh, of the inside calculation there is parallelism so because of combinatorial uh, mm -hmm. aspects uh, the so-called uh, complexity explosion problem is appear so maybe you list some challenge or some some state of that direction in uh, <laughs> this uh, field that uh, help us to fight against uh, complexity explosion problem uh, well, okay 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 uh, thank, thank you. you again uh, thank you Vladimir for this uh, excellent question I well there are no good news about uh, complexity of course uh, to the best of my understanding. I'm not an expert in, in uh, uh, like uh, deep aspects of uh, verification, uh, but uh, what I know is that uh, uh, I mean, what is impossible is impossible, uh, but still my take on, on the use of formal methods and formal verification uh, for engineering systems, um, for like industrial automation systems, for example, is that we cannot, we never be, will be able to fully verify complex systems. But if with our efforts, we can find one uh, error in the, in the software, one additional error uh, that was not um, discovered by kind of usual simulation and debugging efforts, so if through application of formal verification and, and model checking, for example, we able to, uh, to, to little bit extend the range of errors that are discoverable and find one such error for a very safety critical system uh, as nuclear uh, power station, or uh, if, if that formal verification methods were applied uh, to debug the code uh, which made uh, the first launch of Energia uh, booster unsuccessful, you know, that could, could change uh, a lot. So efforts uh, are very much justified, but this is engineering, right? So we are, we are uh, always in, in this kind of uh, trade-off situation. Uh, we can little bit expand the boundaries and uh, we can solve, we can find new, new potential errors in our cyber physical uh, system uh, design. Um, uh, in terms of uh, like more fine uh, kind of recipes, how to, how to break the complexity, you probably know well uh, that uh, some decades ago, there was a big belief in Petrinets and Petrinet based formalisms because uh, in, in the Petronets, you don't have, um, I mean, you, you partially avoid uh, this cross-product issue when, when you use uh, state machines, uh, which are uh, parallel, as you say. So uh, the resulting state machine is a cross-product of those state machines, and that creates computational explosion. Uh, 
uh, in Petronet, if you if you develop your model using Petronet, it's distributed state formalism from the beginning. You avoid part of that explosion. Uh, you know, there are uh, like two uh, orthogonal model checking approaches. One is explicit state and another is a symbolic uh, model checking. Uh, so uh, in some cases, one works better. In some cases, the other works better. Uh, we are trying in our work to, to use both and apply uh, the one which works better in order to, to be able to a little bit extend the boundaries uh, and solve some problems. Um, so so that's, that's, I think, never ending kind of game. The more computational power we have, uh, the more computational tricks like SAT solvers and SMT solvers and bounded model checking we, we apply. The, we, we, we extend the boundaries of solvable problems. Uh, we extend the boundaries of engineering problems where we can apply that. And uh, we, we making this technology more approachable by industry. Uh, so, so that's that's a never ending engineering process in my view. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Dear colleagues, question, questions. So, dear professor, Vyatkin, uh, thank you a lot for your brilliant talk. And uh, I must state that it is a great contribution uh, for our work, uh, for our conference. Thank you a lot. It's been my pleasure. Thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. And I wish uh, the rest of the conference to be full success and, 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 and enjoy wonderful environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. So, uh, colleagues, uh, our next speaker is uh, Ekaterina Shirokova. Ekaterina Shirokova, please. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, <coughs> systems uh, such as, uh, <coughs> such as uh, web services uh, are oriented uh, to work with each other and uh, one of the important tasks uh, is to check the safety properties of <coughs> their joint work. Mm. We consider uh, checking the robustness of um, web services <coughs> using a finite um, automaton model. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, service uh, components m may be implemented by different uh, developers uh, and they may not know uh, share implementation details. That is why it is um, essential to test not only <coughs> the conformance uh, to the specification, but also, <coughs> but also robustness of uh, services. Robustness is um, ability to work uh, correctly with uh, invalid uh, or unspecified uh, data. Uh, it it um, will allow us to use uh, components um, uh, provided by other <coughs> uh, developers uh, and be sure as that um, <coughs> even uh, if we make uh, unexpected uh, request, we will not uh, crash the system. <coughs> mm -hmm. The slide uh, shows uh, some of uh, the most popular attacks uh, on web services, uh, <coughs> such as uh, XSS, SQL injection, <coughs> and um, a malicious file execution. <coughs> uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have uh, previ previously suggested that uh, at least uh, three approaches uh, can be considered for representing attack patterns. Uh, uh, string forma format for, for attack patterns, uh, regular e expression, and uh, automata format <coughs> for attack uh, patterns. <coughs> And uh, we stopped uh, at the third because 
separation on automata are well defined. Automata can efficiently represent infinite sets of strings, and uh, uh, <coughs> this, this approach is scalable um, representation of automata <coughs> in the form of logical circuits. So uh, formally, <coughs> an a finite automaton is a finite set of uh, <coughs> states, of, of, of states, uh, uh, with um, initial null uh, state a, a zero, and it, x is an alphabet of actions, uh, ta, uh, ta is uh, a transition relation which determines all possible <coughs> transition transitions uh, <coughs> and uh, fa is uh, a set of final or accepting states mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the detection of uh, Vulnerabilities uh, in web services can be carried out by solving, solving automata equations. Uh, this approach allows uh, you to determine the set uh, of inputs uh, sequences of actions on the <coughs> web service that can uh, lead uh, to an attack. <coughs> in this uh, work, uh, we consider two types uh, of automata equations. Uh, with respect to concatenation. Uh, in this equations, uh, an automaton S, automaton S <coughs> is known, uh, and S uh, corresponds uh, to malicious uh, input uh, <coughs> uh, data that can reach uh, nodes uh, sensitive to attacks. <coughs> Automata A and B and A, B <coughs> do, do not uh, depend uh, <coughs> on user input. Uh, for example, there, there are um, automata corresponding to nodes with a string uh, contract. <coughs> uh, it is necessary to find uh, an automaton X, X uh, which uh, leads to the possibility of an attack. Mm -hmm. uh, we propose the, the following uh, approaches for finding the uh, largest uh, solution to um, automata equations. Uh, largest uh, solution is a solution that uh, contains all <coughs> possible uh, solutions. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, slide uh, dis discusses the equation, uh, uh, the first equation, AXS, <clears throat> uh, and uh, next tag, and uh, in next uh, slide uh, we can <clears throat> we can see example for this approach. <clears throat> uh, and <clears throat> Also, uh, we uh, this slide discusses uh, the equation of this type mm -hmm. and example for this approach. Mm -hmm. <coughs> As an example of, for considering uh, approaches, uh, we decided uh, to check the robustness of re real uh, web service, uh, uh, the TSU shadow, uh, <coughs> uh, namely the stability of this web services uh, <coughs> uh, was checked against uh, an XSS attack. Uh, this uh, service uh, provides information of the shadow of groups. Mm -hmm. 
uh, class, classrooms and teachers of uh, Tomsk State University. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, well, when a, sh a shadow um, a classroom is checked, uh, this uh, request of the form uh, gen generated. And uh, we uh, can see this um, uh, variable. And the uh, second variable, uh, <coughs> okay. and second variable, um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we uh, replaced on this this uh, string, and we, uh, <coughs> to carry out the attack, the following uh, URL request was entered uh, in, in the browse, browser's address bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the browser, uh, we can see this uh, uh, Windows window, uh, uh, and um, we uh, <coughs> uh, see that this uh, service is not robust, but uh, it, it is uh, <sighs> okay. Con conclusions: uh, We have considered the uh, problem ch checking for robustness using automaton equations and uh, suggested pr procedures for constructing the largest uh, solution for these equations. And uh, when applying these results to real service, uh, it was, was shown that the service is not robust. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Wait, so. Okay, uh, my question is about uh, connections, connection between robustness and correctness. Correctness is, what is correctness in your definition? Uh, it, in my definition, just functioning according to the requirements. Correctness, uh, uh, correctness uh, da, correctness. Functioning within uh, requirements, yeah. but, mm -hmm. and uh, after this we say that uh, robustness is functioning uh, on, on the stable functioning upon unspecified data, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But it is, well, in my opinion, it, it may be just a kind of correct, correctness mm -hmm. because there is a requirement that uh, the algorithm mm -hmm. shall, should, mm -hmm. the functioning uh, mm -hmm. in the case if uh, we have uh, the input data that mm -hmm. uh, is not specified, yes, yes, yes. And so, so uh, robustness is a kind of correctness. Yes, yes, yes you, you see, but non unspecified data. So, okay. And uh, some slide, slide with your definition of uh, automata. I have a feeling that, yes, I have a feeling that, uh, what is it? A is a tuple of A. And what, what is it? A and A. And A, it's it, uh, finite, non-empty set of states. Uh, I, 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 I see some, some problem with understanding. A, it is a tuple of uh, A, and one, one uh, number of the tube, t tuple is A as well. What is it? A defined by, by what? what? What, what is it? In this example, in a set A. Upper, 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 upper. The first uh, sentence is A is equal, A is equal, A, and that's upper, 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 upper. A is equal, A. It's the same, it's the same uh, definition of A from left and right side. It is uh, different. Uh, uh, left, left, uh, 
different meaning, yes. different meanings. English, what? Uh, Metropolitan, uh, yes. a, uh, metropolitan <laughs> is, uh, small a, small a. <laughs> Maybe uh, it will be more uh, yeah. correctly to use, for example, S for states. Mm -hmm. A for automaton, S for states. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Thank you. Questions, thank you. dear colleagues? Some questions? Okay, thank you for your talk. Oh. Ah. The next uh, speaker, our uh, next speaker is Tatiana Lach. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, first, I'm going to remind you about process-oriented approach, uh, which was in previous uh, speech. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, process-oriented approach is used uh, for control software for development of control software such as. Uh, cyber physical systems, uh, physical uh, embedded systems, and so on. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, uh, such systems have uh, strong restrictions on uh, their reliability, on uh, their on their robustness. Uh, so, uh, reflect uh, one of uh, I'm talking about uh, reflex language, and it is used. Uh, process oriented uh, reflex language and it's used for uh, safety critical uh, control software uh, also we develop uh, a different approaches for verification such uh, program such programs and uh, based on um, dynamic verification based on de uh, deductive based on formal verification and today I'm going to bo uh, to talk about adaptation of the model checking approach to the process oriented software well Uh, we are using uh, Promela uh, Spin Verifier because it is uh, rather friendly for new users. Uh, it has uh, C-like syntax and uh, <coughs> uh, Spin uses uh, linear temporal logic. Uh, we are going to check it by the case of uh, lift task. Um, if you were about this task, uh, there is a lift for low mobility users. It has uh, four buttons, uh, two inside the lift, up and down, and uh, two outside the lift. And it has a number of sensors, uh, doors closed, doors open, a lift is on the top floor, in, a lift is on the bottom floor. Uh, a few words about Reflex. Uh, it is based on a uh, hyperprocess model. It has a C-like syntax. Uh, it has a time uh, to get control. Uh, each program of Reflex is a number, a set of uh, interacting processes. Its process has, uh, each process is a construction of finite state machine. It has a number of states. And uh, the language has process, arranger, process operations. It has timeout operations and state operations. Here is a part of um, Lift Controller. Oh. Uh, help you. What? Mm, don't worry, it's okay. okay. Um, uh, requirements for Reflex to promote transformation are, first of all, uh, Reflex program interacts with the environment. And uh, that uh, it has, it means that we should uh, create a controller and uh, a model as of, of a plant. Uh, then uh, Reflex program should contain only integral variables, uh, integers or uh, booleans, because in Perma we don't have floating points. Um, 
controller, uh, pl uh, controller and plant interaction uh, should be only via shared variables. And of course, uh, Promola models should keep uh, all uh, reflex semantics, including uh, process scan, uh, scan cycle, uh, structure of the program, uh, fun uh, processes, functional states, and time management. Well. Uh, reflex variables are mapped to uh, Promola variables. For each process, uh, we create additional, uh, two additional variables, uh, function state, uh, pr process state and uh, time point. Um, reflex process, uh, processes are mapped to Promala processes with do or loop cycle. Uh, and um, synchronization of uh, these processes happens via uh, one capacity channel. Uh, when a process starts, uh, it's uh, run only when it receives a uh, concrete message. Okay. And what else? Yeah. And uh, process, execu process execution, uh, process uh, are executed um, in turn. Our first uh, uh, special process environment um, imitates uh, the environment in fields, uh, some output values, then it is okay. And then processes of uh, plant emulator Ah, I'm looking for a laser, but it's not here. Okay. Uh, then uh, the plant uh, processes start to run, and uh, only after plant, uh, controller executes these processes. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, we formulated a number of uh, requirements to the lift. Uh, first of all, uh, simulations up and down signals are prohibited. Uh, platform, uh, platform movement only is possible only with closed doors. Uh, the movement begins after pressing uh, one of call buttons, and if no external control uh, commands within 20 seconds, the platform should be automatically moved to the lower floor. Uh, so the result of verification shows that first and uh, last, uh, the last requirements are satisfied, but uh, the second requirements wasn't satisfied in the uh, realization of uh, lift controller. And uh, the third and the fourth requirements are um, in contradiction. Uh, no. These are contradictionary uh, requirements. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we developed uh, methods for reflex uh, to Promola code translation, and we tested these methods. Uh, we, verif we verified uh, the control software of Leaf platform. Well, thank you. I think five thank minutes. You. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, colleagues, questions? Question. <laughs> so, huh? you need can, can I ask a question? question? Ah, yes. Yeah, of yes, please. A questions from Zoom. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, from whom? From Zoom. <laughs> Zoom. Me. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, this is me, Val Valerie Atkin, speaking. Ah, ah yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, two, two obvious questions. How did you get your Promela program from Reflex program? Was it manually written or automatically generated? Uh, right now, it, it is written manually, but uh, automatic generation is our future plans. And the second question, you mentioned model of the plant. So you follow the closed loop approach in, in your modeling. That's very nice. Uh, but um, how, do you, how do you model the plant? Uh, is, is a model of the plant uh, timed? Uh, do, do you have timing in the model of the plant? Uh, it was a digital model. Uh, it was written in Reflex. Uh, and after then, uh, we're okay. Model. Question about dynamic, dynamic behavior of the. Yeah, they, they, well, is, is there a timing in, in the reflex? Is it possible to use timing? Yeah, it's possible to use timing in reflex. But uh, how, 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 how you translate timing to Promela? Uh, in, in model, we didn't use timing, but um, in future. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I see. So your, your Promela model is purely uh, yeah, discrete uh, state but model. Uh, we
created a mechanism, uh, some additional uh, variables, uh, timing variables, uh, which will be used in Promela for timing. It just okay. clocks Thank for, uh, it just uh, clocks for uh, each process. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I commit. It seems that uh, the timing in Promela can be modeled with arrays or maybe counter that uh, count uh, quantity of loops, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. this, I think. So, other questions? Okay, it's, uh, uh, it's okay. It's okay, so the next uh, talk is about, uh, is about and and uh, a question before it is uh, as, as, as I understand in the, uh, in the what this current talk uh, you obtain uh, kind of translation semantics yeah, it's, yes uh, but it's is still, it possible yeah it's possible to create. but still yeah. it's not formalized. So, so when you speak about future direction, it means that just implementation of the transformation, translation of semantics of the reflex to Promela uh, by software meaning, mm -hmm. by automatically. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the next talk is uh, right. They are based web IDE for the reflex language. Tatiana Lach, please. Thank you. <coughs> We're still talking about process-oriented uh, control software. And another problem of process-oriented control software, especially about reflex language, that it, uh, it, didn't, ha it uh, didn't have a specialized uh, ID. Well, the modern trend is uh, web-based IDs, so the objective was what of our research was uh, to develop um, Specialized ID for reflex language and for process oriented control software. Okay. Uh, in order uh, to understand the required functionality, we analyzed uh, a number of popular IDs and understand uh, what uh, functionality they provide to decrease the coding time, and such as syntax highlighting, uh, auto completion, code generation, and etc. Uh, the, uh, so we formulated requirements. Uh, web uh, reflex uh, ID, uh, shortly write, uh, should provide reflex-oriented code editor. It should uh, provide uh, possibilities uh, to user workspace management. It should support two versions, uh, web and desktop, and it must be extendable with uh, to provide developers the possibility to increase its functionality. Uh, to assemble port modularity and provide communication channel with code, the best way is to use abstract syntax, abstract syntax tree of the code. Uh, Write has to support core module, which supports uh, abstract syntax tree of the code, and the name specific uh, modules like extensions of the of Write. Uh, this may be, uh, for example, translators to another languages, uh, dynamic or formal verification tools. Oh, graphical, maybe some graphical representation of the code. Uh, IP has to provide uh, IST for all domain-specific models, and it should be extendable with new DSMs. Okay, uh, the developed right architecture contains uh, front-end and back-end parts. Front-end parts contains a graphical user interface with editor and uh, graphical user and uh, GUI parts of DSMs, domain-specific models. And uh, another, another part is DSM writer. This extension allows to creation new of new DSMs. Um, the DSM uh, client part, uh, DSM wrapper client part, uh, extends uh, the user interface of write. It's DSM's, DSM's GUI. And uh, the server part runs and manages DSM's processes. Each DSM has uh, an access uh, to the IST of user's code. Well, and uh, the extension IST service provides uh, IST to all other modules. Uh, to implement, oh, it's not shown here. 
to implement extent, uh, to, to implement right, uh, we decided to choose uh, Xtext framework for uh, parser, uh, for code parser for for generation of parser. Uh, it supports a language server protocol. It works directly with uh, text files, and uh, it uh, gives a wide wide unity with, uh, of integration with other tools. As a framework for as a framework for write, we choose uh, Eclipse Sia. Uh, Sia it's modern, fast developing uh, cloud IDE framework. It allows native integration of Xtext artifacts. It supports two versions, both desktop and um, cloud version. Uh, it uses very beautiful Monaco editor, and it has open license. Well. Uh, the design architecture with the uh, has ISD service. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, it has a write model as a fed jar. And ISD service is an uh, inversible uh, extension of C and other models can integrate it. Well, uh, here is an example of uh, C interface. It uh, looks like similar like Monaco editor. It has an editor, it has a command line, it has a project tree and code structure and many others. Uh, well, here is an example uh, of how auto completion works uh, with integrated uh, reflex server, LSP reflex server. And um, here is another part of uh, user interface. DSMs are integrated as. Um, they inject IST service and uh, they are uh, built in uh, Spring applications and they are based in uh, Docker containers. Oh, that's okay. Uh, conclusion. <laughs> so we created a prototype of web-based Reflex ID, right? Uh, for future research, uh, we are going to develop a DSM plane based on React framework and uh, we want to integrate it with Eclipse Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your talk. Yeah, colleagues, question? Yes, please. Please. Yeah, I see. see. Yes, yes, yes. I clearly understand. Do you use Docker in your system? Yeah. Why you don't use Kubernetes? Uh, it's a very good question, and it's uh, our next step because here we are planning to integration with Eclipse Che. It's um, environment uh, to manage user workspaces. It is based on Kubernetes. Thank you. It is natively integrated with CIA. Uh, thank you. Please, microphone. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have several questions. The first is, Am I right that you did it by yourself or you have some team developing this IDE? Yeah, of course, it's a team. Okay, so the first question is, do you use some software design patterns, you know, some factory patterns, something something else? Um, SIA provides uh, already um, a ready pattern and it uses Inversify, uh, Inversify framework. Okay, and the next, about the documentation, do you use some application to documentate your code, like Doxygen or something uh, like that? Still not, but it's also in future plans as DSM. Okay, thank you. Yes, and short questions, why we will see your project on the web? When? When uh, we will see your yeah, project on the web? What? No, yes. but when, you when, what, what is your, what is your expectation? When? I don't know how will you be ready. For okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for your talk. So, so the next uh, speaker, our speaker is about, uh, is about. Владислав Башев.
now I will talk about another process oriented uh, language, POST. Uh, the process oriented uh, language POST is a combination of advantages of a process oriented paradigm with the conventional syntax of structured text language from the IC 6141 Part 3 language set and can be easily adapted by the policy community. For the POST language, we have already developed an Eclipse based GUI and uh, a single Java JAR translator uh, to structure text language and special format uh, policy open XML exchange. But currently, the users need to install our developed tools on their local computer. And uh, this additional effort uh, limits the number of users who would like to formalize themselves with a POST language. To solve this problem, we propose to use network technologies and provide a web application for translating POST language to a structured text language and PLC open XML exchange format. Uh, requirement, requirements have been developed for our web application. First, uh, the functionality of application should be accessed by a user through a web browser with an active network connection only. Second, it, de it depends from a uh, web browser and it depends from uh, specific standard development tools. Fourth, the interface should uh, provide uh, post language ex examples and patterns, uh, editor window for post programs, uploading post programs from the user's local PC, downloading post code, ST code and uh, XML file, and uh, the last, finally, window for translator error and warning messages. Uh, the architecture of the post OST web application is shown on a slide. Standard centralized client-server architecture based on the standard HTTP protocol with HTML pages. Well, here you can see the link to our developed web application. Uh, the interface of web application you can see here on the slide, uh, it uh, contains of uh, three text windows. First is the post window for uh, editable post code. Second is uh, uh, a ST window for resulting uh, structured text code. And third is the message window for uh, translator uh, diagnostic messages. And the last fourth is uh, block of buttons. Block of buttons contains of three columns. First it's uh, translate and open column with translate button in the open uh, but, uh, Postcode from a local computer buttons. Second column is a download column for where you can uh, download postcode, a stack code, and XML exchange. And the third uh, column is uh, examples where you can open an uh, empty template, a uh, hand, uh, uh, hand dryer example, and elevator example. Uh, the server site uh, implements using Flask framework and uh, Java to run post to ST jar translator. Here you can see the example of a translate command to handle algorithm. Upon the translate command, uh, Flask redirects control to Java with the POST file. Uh, POST to ST jar translator generates resulting ST file, XML file, log file, and return control to Flask. Flask reads the necessary files, uh, generates the response, and sends it back to the client. A web application for translating of the POST language allows once to create small program on the POST language without installing software on the user's site, which simplifies the initial uh, occurrence a quantity of with the POST language. The servers provide checking of the syntax and semantic rules of the program and generate a structured text code and PLC open XML exchange file, which can be used in the existing standard development tools. We plan to use the proposed approach for promoting and testing of multiply our tools developed within our future research. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, colleagues, question, please. For the questions, uh, is it possible to use uh, your cloud computing now? Yeah, it's, it's uh, working at, at this time in Newton. Okay. Uh, what 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 about group uh, group development of the uh, software control uh, software? I developed with, uh, it by my own. Uh, which which way you 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 plan just share functionality of this uh, web uh, application or just what? 
Uh, yes, I show its analogy and. Uh, ah, is uh, which kind of technology do you plan to use? Uh, I use Flask and uh, Java. No, no, no. I, I, I mean for group uh, development. It means that must be login, registration, uh, uh, maybe uh, possibility to uh, to edit the same text uh, by web kind kind of google uh, google doc or something ah, like yes, this uh, we use uh, cookies uh, no, we save uh, some small string in the cookies of a uh, user uh, that will be removed uh, after a few time on the user side and uh, these cookies uh, used to um, save some information about uh, session with a uh, uh, user so on the server side, when you, when the user access our site, on the server side, uh, open, open session for this user and save information about it for uh, some time. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Oh, microphone, please. <coughs> Uh, okay, uh, I don't uh, really understand from your in microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, I don't really understand. Uh, who is the main interested persons uh, ab about your system? Uh, host language uh, have a great relevance in the community. Yeah. Like we hope so, and uh, we serve as uh, you know, for. Uh, people from the Telsi community okay. who uh, would like to formalize themselves with the post language. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So next, next talk, next talk uh, is about. Developing Reflex IDE kernel with Xtext framework. It's uh, as, as I see the topic is connected with the previous uh, talks. Uh, Tatiana Lachmoy. Yeah. Okay, yes. the, right uh, as well. The the same language. Language. So, uh, the process-oriented language reflex, uh, reflex has been successfully used in multiplayer industrial applications and demonstrated promising qualities, producing easily readable, maintainable code and overall stable and uh, reliable software. Uh, but the existing toolkit for a re reflex language was created manually, without the use of uh, automated domain-specific language development technologies. The technologies used to develop do not mix well. To use uh, the toolkit is difficult to integrate into a single development environment, yet it is hard to support. To solve this problem, uh, we uh, refactor the existing tools in order to create, to create and integrate uh, development, development environments or IDE for uh, reflex language, which we briefly uh, call right reflex IDE. Requirements have been developed for our write kernel. First, uh, the format, uh, text format should uh, be used for representing uh, reflex program source code. Second, the development should be based on automated parser generation method. Third, the IDE should be extensible with problem oriented models. Fourth, the IDE kernel should uh, include an editor, and the last field uh, chosen by cell technologies should allow developers to port the IDE to different platforms platforms. Uh, the following tools for uh, domain-specific languages development were analyzed. Uh, GNU, Bison and Hunter as the parser generators and uh, JetBrains and PC and Xtext as uh, domain-specific languages development frameworks. Based on the analysis result and uh, on the requirements, it was decided to choose, choose uh, Xtext framework to build a right kernel. Mm. Uh, the developed idea architecture is shown on the slide. Right uh, kernel contains of the following components. First is a language-based editor. 
Second is a parser, which uh, automatically generates from the description of a reflex grammar and generates uh, abstract syntax tree from the reflex uh, source code. Next is a semantic analysis component, uh, which performs a set of semantic checks on the generated abstract syntax tree. Next is delegating code generator, uh, which uh, controls the operation of uh, problem-oriented extension models. It takes an abstract syntax tree as input and redirects it to the loaded uh, extension models. No, and finally, problem-oriented models, here, uh, which takes the program abstract syntax tree and generates a set of particular artifacts. So for example, generates another code or um, graphical some interface. The grammar of reflex language was refactored and defined using XTX notation, uh, which is close to extended Becos now form. Uh, Xtext framework uh, automatically generates uh, parser, uh, abstract syntax tree, Eclipse uh, base uh, IDE UI, Reflex uh, language editor, and uh, some Java classes to work with uh, abstract syntax tree. Xtext offers two methods of specifying semantic checks. First, it's a mechanism for uh, specification of semantic rules, where it creates custom rules uh, on the generated abstract syntax tree. And uh, second is the specification of contextual links between program identificators and abstract syntax tree objects. Uh, both of these methods were used. Uh, resulting write kernel represented by a Java object, fetjar. Once triggered part of a write kernel with delegating form generator, uh, <clears throat> finds all the registered extension and invokes it. Uh, the extensibility of write kernel was verified by implementing a C code, C code generation models for microcontrollers of AVR family. Uh, as a result of this research, an extensible idea kernel for the process oriented language reflex uh, was created using XTX framework. The kernel is based on the parser and semantic analysis model. Kernel's uh, architecture provides an easy way of the extending the developed, uh, development environment with additional problem-oriented models. The extensibility of uh, Reflex IDE uh, kernel was verified by implementing SQL generation. The described result uh, was used to create a web version of uh, IDE based on Eclipse Day technology that you heard uh, with the previous speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Your colleagues, question, please. Uh, can you please uh, return to the slide with architecture? Okay, uh, here is two blocks, uh, like parser and uh, semantic analyzer. Um, can you please tell me how did you test these blocks? Uh, these two models generate by XTX framework automatically. Parser is no, uh, Xtext using uh, Angular parser mm -hmm. uh, no, it generates from the definition of X, uh, reflex grammar. But on semantic uh, rules, uh, we, no, we have an abstract syntax tree. Uh, we can analyze it uh, by creating our custom uh, rules mm -hmm. uh, and uh, show the semantic errors or warnings. Okay, thank you. So it's by box, in box. Yes, yes. solution, solution, box solution, yeah. So it's uh, Eclipse, uh, Xtext, Extend, uh, in box solution, yeah. So, question? Question? Okay. So uh, uh, what about uh, post? Uh, previously you talk about post, now you speak about reflex ID architecture. Uh, is it uh, the same approach or maybe or what what about post and reflex ID architecture? Here I am one of the speaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 I see, I see, I see. Uh, it's it's, it's question about connection between reflex and post and no. maybe why reflex or maybe why post and why? Why two languages that, uh, as I see, cover uh, the same 
uh, the same uh, kind of, of uh, software, this control software. Yes, this is yes, both cross-oriented languages, but uh, the reflex uh, language uh, is adapted, adapted by mm, in the, no, Communication, uh, community. Yeah, or all community, I would like to say, I guess. And the post uh, language is for uh, IC 6141 community for the PLC development. Uh, it has similar uh, sem no, syntaxes, no, semantic, but syntax is, no, uh, reflex is a syn, have syn notation, uh, post have structured text notation. Structured text kind of uh, Pascal. Pascal. Yeah. Pascal like. Okay. Okay, what, what about uh, architecture, about solution uh, for, for, the, for reflex ID and post ID? Uh, we develop on the same technology. Are there any different? The same. The same. The same. The same. Okay. Yeah, colleagues, questions? Okay. Thank you a lot Thank for you. your presentation. <laughs> So, dear, uh, dear participant, we have opportunity maybe. Okay, let's slightly uh, different uh, talk about, as I see, about uh, contra-intuitive uh, objects. Denis Migranov. Denis Migranov. Yeah, as Dr. Zubin please. has said, Five minutes, please. today I'll tell you about a system for visualizing the three-dimensional non-Euclidean spherical and music spaces without them. First of all, what's the point of visualizing non-Euclidean spaces? Such spaces find application in various fields the of microphone, physics. microphone, please. Such spaces find application in various fields of physics and mathematics. But the problem is the mathematical description might be hard to perceive. And that's where the possibilities of computer graphics come in handy. They could be used for visualizing various properties of such spaces, but also allowing to add some interactivity. And two examples of such spaces are the spherical and elliptic spaces. And the library developed by me allows to visualize them. What exactly are these spaces? The spherical space can be seen as a hypersphere lying in the four-dimensional Euclidean space. The question is, how can we define some transformations of objects lying in it, which is necessary if you want to visualize something? For that purpose, we can use elements of its isometric group, the orthogonal group of 44, whose elements can be represented as 4x4 four four orthogonal matrices. And these matrices can be used for defining transformations of its objects. As for the elliptic space, it can simply be thought of as the same hypersphere with its antipodal points identified. We will use the same hypersphere for modern space, so the same matrices will be used. More precisely, these matrices are used for obtaining, using the computer graphics terminology, the so-called world and view matrices, which are used for positioning scene objects and the camera, respectively. The last matrix that is necessary for visualization is a projection matrix, which is used for projecting scene objects onto a plane, that is, screen. All of these matrices are multiplied and applied to vertices of scene objects, and after realization, we obtain the resulting bitmap image. One thing worth noting is that in each frame, a scene has to be rendered twice due to the spaces being closed. Another important thing is how the view matrices are calculated. For that purpose, an algorithm that allows to implement first-person shooters-like controls was proposed. Basically, it uses the change of basis formula for matrices. To simplify navigation and orientation in such spaces, uh, the distance walk effect was implemented. Uh, this effect makes it easier to differentiate between objects that are near and far from the observer. Uh, basically, it's based on modifying pixel colors using alpha blending with the fog color. The formula is on the slide. Uh, alpha is the fog factor. There are multiple ways to calculate it, for example, using the exponent. But what matters is that it decreases with increasing the distance between the camera and the points of interest. And the one thing that would be different in the Euclidean case is measuring such distances. 
all these approaches and algorithms were implemented in the C++ library. The library uses the directory D11 Graphics API to uh, allow for real-time rendering and exploit the capabilities of GPUs. Uh, the library is based on anti-component system architectural pattern, and due to this, it's extensible in the sense that other spaces visualization can be easily implemented. The library allows adding various objects to the scene, mapping texture to them, dynamic and interactive scenes can also be created. And here's an example of a scene in the spherical space. What you can see is six same side spheres and also another bigger one. But what's interesting is In the microphone, please. Right. What's interesting is how their apparent sizes change with distance. First, they decrease just like in the Euclidean case. But then, they start increasing again. This is a consequence of, uh, this, of the behavior of geodesics forming the camera's field of view. All right, so to put it briefly, a library that allows visualizing the three-dimensional non-Euclidean spaces was developed. It uses the directory D11 graphics API and to allow for real-time rendering. Uh, the library is extensible, so other spaces visualizations can easily be implemented. Right now, it allows visualizing the spherical and elliptic spaces whose visualization was discussed, and also the toric space, which you can see on the slide. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, please? Please, yes. Hello. Uh, as I see, um, as I can see in your report, uh, you used the matrices. Yes, and these matrices uh, have a big sparsity. Am I right? Not really. They are four by four matrices. Uh, in your example, uh, this matrix, matrix uh, almost diagonal. Yes. There are many zeros. It's an matrix, but it's not big, so yeah. Ah, so these matrices are it's very little. Four. Oh, okay. Okay. Then there's no questions. <laughs> yeah, that's microphone, please. <coughs> yes, hello. My name is Ruslan Akhvashev. Uh, you showed the Earth example. Is it? Yes. Is it right that it's an, that this example, it's an ideal sphere? Shown as a as an ideal sphere, yes. No. Truth be told, these so-called spheres are not actually spheres. I kind of lied to you. Uh, question question is about object or about question, space. Question yes about this this space. form of this space. Earth space or object or object object ah, yes object. about the Earth. This the question is is it, is it sphere or not? I got it, yeah. These spheres are not actually spheres. Let me draw an analogy with the two-dimensional case. Imagine the regular sphere lying in the three-dimensional Euclidean case. Yep. You can choose various circles on it. Some of them are geodesics, but some are not. For instance, parallels are not geodesics. And these so-called spheres are actually two-dimensional parallels. Okay. Now, my question is, is it possible to draw the actual Earth which is not ideal sphere, just with the matrices. Well, it is possible if we have the necessary 3D model, we of course can put it into the system and visualize it. Okay, and in the GitHub, do you have any open issues to contribute? Is there some, some, some issues to do? Right now there isn't, and also there is no manual. So if you have any questions, you better write. So it's finally it. done, this work. It's not done. I plan to re implement visualization of other spaces. OK, OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. It's very uh, <laughs> uh, specific talk, but uh, I see that my question is very interesting. My question is about, uh, about uh, maybe physical uh if it's we oh for example we, we, uh, can we 
use not only spherical ecliptic spaces, but uh, spaces that produced in modern physics. I, I mean, firstly, uh, firstly, I mean something like black holes. Because there is a lot of so-called black holes in the internet and the YouTube, it's such kind, that kind of that. Uh, is it possible to use your approach to uh, produce uh, some image or maybe some spaces with uh, black holes where uh, we, as user from the first uh, person, yes, uh, from first face, or it is in English. Uh, we, we can uh, fly in this space and look around uh, black holes and maybe objects around black holes and see which way it will look like according to the modern physics theory. Thank you. This approach that uses matrices for defining transformations of objects can be used for visualizing like spaces that are that have variable curvature. For instance, space. Uh, geometry of space around black holes. Yes, yes. You have exactly. to use different approach. Uh, you have to use ray tracing. Then it will be possible. There's also another option. For example, there is a Friedman model of the general theory of relativity. And in this model, the space at any moment of time has a constant curvature. And in this case, this approach can be used. Yes, yes. I do, do plan to use maybe a ray tracing approach or something like this for the spaces without constant uh, radius of curve. Yes, there are some yes. plans, but yes. first I plan to... But when? What? When? When? After when? I visualize after <laughs> non clean spaces like hyperbolic space, uh, like, a, yeah, like this. But in time, I, how, how much time do you, uh, you need to fulfill the, uh, this task? Hyperbolic space or... How much time? How much my, my time? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe two months. Two months, For okay. For hyperbolic space, okay. then I can start okay. rotating. Okay. And then I personally expect for non-linear, non non, uh, for sp uh, some solution for spaces with non-constant radius of uh, curvature, yeah? Thank you. Change is constant. Advances that didn't seem possible are now within reach. In this lifetime, we may witness our biggest questions answered, our toughest challenges solved, our greatest advances reached. But this will require a different way to innovate, to nurture the far-fetched, to converge, to secure, to lead. The next frontiers will require seamless workflows, ultra-precision measurements, and intelligent analytics. They will require innovators to stay ahead, to go faster, to disrupt. And there's only one company in the world that can keep up. Keysight. With expertise in high-frequency design, scalable testing solutions, network visibility, complex modulation, protocols, and engaged with the latest standards and technology pioneers. We test so you can dream. So, Anna Vaganova. Hello, my dear colleagues. I, my name is Anna Vaganova. And first, I'm going to present you my co So is Professor Dmitry Polchinov. Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. Uh, let's get started. Uh, business is high need for digital transformation, and one of the way of digitalization is uh, modeling of business process. A new approach to modeling uh, business process is the use of digital twins. Uh, we propose a concept for development of digital twins business process based on semantic domain specific languages. We are developing a digital twin so for all of the business process and introducing a new concept, a digital deputy overall, which is a more complex concept. 
Uh, digital twin is a dynamic virtual representation of physical object or system uh, through its entire life cycle using data in real time, which fully describes the developed or existing object. We are used for sol we are use used for solving industrial and business problem. To create digital twins of business process, it is necessary to de describe knowledge about subject area, model rules, and roles involve the process. But business processes are constantly changed, and we need to be able to, to create digital twins of business process, which has ability to adapt to changing conditions. Uh, to resolve this problem, we use semantic domain-specific languages as DSL. We are allowed to describe declaratively domain knowledge and implement this knowledge into exe execu executable code. If we create uh, digital twins on, on SDSL and want to change it when business processes have changed, the main expert can make it easily, can set specification in a semantic language and we will be automatically executed and translated in, into executable code. The language Denolisail implements the ideas of SDSL in a practice. A formal description of digital twins is created in language of first predicate uh, logic. We use quantifier-free formulas of a signature, and when can be automatically converted into delta zero formulas, and when translated into specification in the language D0 SL. To create digital twins of business process, we need to create digital twins of role in the business process. Role in the business process is a set of competences possessing which a participant in the business process can perform wave functions. Role is defined by responsibilities and authorities uh, during operation of business process. A digital role model is built on this basis and described formally in the language D0 cell. The D0 cell specification in further translated into executable code. On the slide, you can see a fragment of the digital twin of roles. This fragment included the semantic model, which consists of predicate and allow to work with the documents. As part of uh, the developed approach, we considered not only digital twins of roles, but our more complex object, digital deputies. We develop a new concept. A digital deputy of role is not just simulation model of the original, but a system that is able to perform action, actions of its original with business process. Dig digital dep deputies of role may interact both with each other and with real people playing roles in business process. A digital deputy of roles is able to provide services of semantic search network and decision support system based on provided knowledge. We proposed an approach to develop of digital twins of business process using semantic domain specific languages. We present the concept of the digital twins of role. We based our description on language of first order predicate logic. We use quantifier free formulas of a signature and transform them into a specification in the language the zero cell. We developed a set of digital roles of twins, a new concept, digital deputy of roles. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Your colleagues, the questions. Okay, I have a question. What, what is the difference between digital twin and computer model, computer simulation? What is the difference? Uh, it's a next step of digital simulation, digital twins. Computer simulation. It's an uh, industry for... Digital twins, it, it is a, comp a computer yes. model, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, what is the difference from the classical uh, simulator? Mm, oh, digital twins use uh, data, real-life data. Every Don't wait uh, some new data, but on, every time we uh, have data for models. Okay. How? Okay. Using that data okay. in real time. Okay, but, <laughs> yes. uh, but in my opinion, uh, <laughs> computer uh, simulator uh, do the same, mostly. This. Okay, okay. So, questions? Yeah, colleagues. And uh, what is uh, uh, what is uh, what is role? You speak about roles. Role, what was business roles? process. Yeah, roles, it's, it's kind of actors. Yes, it can be access uh, to some set of competences, knowledge, right, right access, and yes, another yes. data. And we uh, create, de develop digital twins for what? 
purpose. Which way do you plan to use these digital twins in the real life? Uh, in we, practice. We, we, in we practice. maybe be, will be used in a, for some roles who um, have so many work with uh, documents and uh, digital roles or digital twin of roles uh, of, the, of the that roles uh, help uh, original people uh, make some things with them. Uh, can, can you uh, provide some example, real um, life example? Some example it's maybe a, from, from education? It's a, uh, yes, maybe. it's a from education or for uh, developing... Some example, please. Uh, for building... Uh, for, for building. <laughs> building has so many documents, special document, and so many uh, document moving and uh, uh, digital twins of that role uh, can uh, help original actor uh, to solve some problem, solve time. Some, some, what kind of problem? Uh, like, uh, mm. for example, <laughs> uh, in English it's hard. Mm. What kind of problem the lecturer has? Like, uh, if you need uh, to... To prepare a presentation, for example. Maybe, no? yes, if Maybe. you have some special structure. Uh, it, uh, you just... Uh, uh, on data in a role, uh, presentation can be made. And so your digital twins can help the lecturers to create some presentation of his lecture. Maybe yes. 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 And what to col col collect some pictures? Yes. Of, or, some yeah. some knowledge about uh, this yes. thing. This. Mm -hmm. To compile the text. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And then sound it instead of lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, colleagues. Uh, my, my, yes. I ate. Uh, uh, my, yes, yes, yes. Uh, some, some uh, remarks from Zoom. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, please. And also, I would like to add something. Well, uh, <coughs> I would like to point out what now is the difference between model and digital twin in our consideration. And I, I would like to speak now not just about digital uh, digital twin but about digital deputy. Yes, because we try to, to, to make a next step, digital deputy. And the principal difference uh, between uh, model and uh, digital deputy is activity. Model is passive. Uh, using model of using some simulation, uh, we can understand, we, we can investigate some properties uh, of... Uh, <laughs> Some properties of, of real objects, uh, well, uh, but only this property what we want to understand. The, uh, the aim of digital deputy not only to demonstrate some properties. Uh, the aim is to, to be something like smart assistant, but uh, smart assistant also is a bit passive because uh, assistant help only uh, just just specified task which I ask uh, to help, yes? Uh, but uh, a digital deputy may have uh, total activity, what what means? Uh, that it, it may have some plan of works and uh, make uh, some, uh, some books, some uh, activities uh, instead of real person. For example, there are a lot of routine. Uh, for example, in when we consider some decision support systems for real business. Well, um, modeling business processes, there are a lot of routine to find uh, out some information, uh, some uh, there are everyday information, for example, to collect this information and so on. This routine may be done by uh, automatically by, by such, uh, such a digital deputy. Uh, so the digital deputy has some roles uh, 
and automatically make uh, automatically makes some uh, role some activities instead of real person uh, of course under control and supervision by this real uh, real person yes is it clear okay thank you thank you for your great remark uh, the things uh, became much clear for us that but uh, anna uh, <laughs> say that that maybe it will be a digital twin deputy for lecturer in Novosibir State University, some lecturer. And, uh, okay. So, any questions, colleagues? Yes, please. Okay, I have a little question. Um, how did you plan to perform the communication? Uh, between your digital twin or digital deputy uh, and uh, with object communicate with the digital twin and object yeah your digital twin must communicate with object yes with uh, another digital twin no, no, or no. with with, uh, with the uh, mod with the processor model with the business yeah. process Maybe with data, with uh, information, with users. Parent, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Uh, your digital twin uh, copied uh, some real object, yes? Yes. So he must communicate with this object? Yes. Uh, so how did you plan to perform this communication? Uh, usually for uh, digital twins of business process and you, you, digital twin of roles, it's uh, digital twin just... Uh, Mm, get some information from bases, from knowledge uh, bases. Okay. By by uh, database. Yes. By, right. okay. Via okay. database. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? So okay. Thank you a lot. <laughs> so we we have. Uh, three speaker and we have 30 minutes up to uh, up to coffee break so so okay the next uh, uh, speaker is Kristina Morozova yes please hello dear colleagues today I present to you our scientific work on the topic using coalition of neural network to restore audio signal in general, the audio signal processing consists of several directions, the main ones on the slide. Audio signal restoring is a fundamental problem which is usually solved using signal processing, machine learning techniques. One of the significant work is the field of signal processing. Oh, this tool based on neural networks and it was used to highlight the vocal part. The, the significance of this work is that the developers have shown that you can process audio signals as images decompose it into frames and achieve the result using convolutional neural networks. Using the convolutional neural networks, we can consider several frequency pools and get one as a result. Let's consider our case. Some blue song was taken as a studied sound, sound signal. As a, particular, as a particular task of restoring audio signal, we are interested in restoring removed drum part. The audio signal without drum part is restored to a signal with drum part. On the slide, you can see the frequency decomposition of the original audio signal and the audio signal with a drum part removed. To consider to set the features of future for future work, the audio signal should be decomposed. We use the Fourier transform. The enter signal goes through Fourier transform, and the result we achieve array of complex numbers, which shows the fuzz in amplitude of the audio signal at a specific frequency interval and in the specific time interval. Then the first half of the signal in time is transmitted to a neural network for training, and then we predict the second half of the audio signal. We need to restore a drum part in each specific time, in, uh, in specific frames of audio signal, or skip it if uh, there are no drum part in this frame. Suppose that there are some kind of dependencies between the investigated frame and the neighbor ones. We can restore them using convolutional neural network. Here you can see the mathematical description of our approach. We don't have enough time to consider all its for formulas, so you can find it in details in our paper. 
Uh, to restore one single frame, we consider 25 consensus frames. Let us assume that this number is enough to establish all complex dependencies and in time in between different frequency ranges. Therefore, out of 25 frames, we restore one frame in the middle. The original solution was to reconstruct the entire 512 frequency ranges in the output, uh, in input audio signal using single neural network. Initially, we used the architecture depicted on the slide, which restores the enter frequency range at one specific time interval. The initial implementation of neural network was quite time consuming, both in training and work. Nevertheless, it was possible to obtain high quality results since the network produced a noisy original outcome of the audio signal. The constructed architectures of neural network assume to restore just a part of enter frequency range by splitting the range into several. So each work process its own frequency range. And it was supposed that such approach sh should improve the accuracy by reducing the number of unknowns to be restored. The same 512 bands are processed by 32 neural networks, which return 16 frequency bands as output. The input layer with dimension 512 25 2 transforms through the network dimension 16 1 2 and then it's added to a corresponding input part of the audio signal. Thus, it's not a pure modification of audio signal that's performing, but the addition to the original signal with restored missing elements. To improve the results, we increased the number of neural networks and therefore reduced the frequency range processed by each network. As a result, the obtained frequency complements of the original audio signal become more pronounced. The restored audio signal is close to original due to the fact that the coefficients of the network become more specific set of unknowns. We show the spectrograms of the original audio signal with the drum part and the uh, audio signal which was obtained using the neural network with 32, 64 and 128 networks respectively. On these figures you can ever see, uh, visually notice that the similarity of the original and the restored signal, which is indicator of the method's quality. In this way, as can be seen in images, with an increase in the number of neural networks, the result of our work is getting closer to expected. But at the same time, the noise level of audio signal also increases. Why are pictures used to relate the result? The metric in the training is loss functional mean square error. The loss function is used to indicate how far the forecast deviates from the target values. During the training phase, the weights are updated based on this amount. While the neural network is training, the losses are reduced, which helps to track the process in of training in the current performance of the network. The value of metrics in our case is not informative for evaluating the prediction result, since it's not clear whether drums appeared in the audio signal or frame noise was obtained. The result estimated adequately by ear so we can say that the main indicator of assessment is subjective. And within the framework of this work, the task was set to restore the signal. And it can be argued that if some components were removed from the signal or if distortion occurred, this is possible to build such a complex regression model using missing data dependencies on the remain, which allow us to restore the signal. Thank you for attention. <laughs> Rachel. Rachel, please. So, uh, uh, I personally interested, uh, are there any practical, uh, empirical maybe result of your approach? Right now? No. But we no. But please, please show the uh, topology of the neural before, before, slide. Oh, yeah, this. Can, can you explain what, what does it mean? This is layers of neural networks. There are some. It look like the same. You, you, do you use two, uh, two netwer network, oh, two neural uh, network with uh, the same topology, the same architecture? What networks. is the difference? What is the difference? Why, why do you use uh, two uh, equivalent neural networks? And what is the result of it? What is the value? 
architecture of each networks is uh, equal to each other. But we use uh, several networks to work on one uh, task. And what? Uh, what is the difference? What? What, what is uh, difference? One network or, or one hundred networks, if uh, they are the same. They restore its own frequency range, uh, part of whole frequency range. Ah, so you, you firstly filter your input signals on the range, yes. Okay, and what, uh, what uh, uh, do you have at the end of the, of the scheme? Best yeah, at the end, at the end of previous, previous. Uh, audio signal, and we, this, this signal undergoes uh, Fourier transform again. No, one, for example, one network uh, says it, it is sound A, the second on the range from, for example, from uh, 10 uh, kilohertz to, uh, for, for hertz to, uh, for example, 40 hertz. So the, the next uh, neural network say that it is not A, it is um, I, for example. And what, what, what we will do? A the signal next. is signal without ground part. And B signal is signal with ground part. Recognition, uh, resolution is not uh, physical. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What, what, you, ah, yes, question. Microphone, please. Uh, thank you for your report. I have a question. You mentioned uh, that you use uh, a number of networks. And my first question, uh, were they the same act ar architecture or it was networks with different architecture? It was the same architectures, but uh, it's different in numbers of networks. Uh -huh. And is this architecture based on some known architecture or it is your own? Uh, it's, my your own uh, it's my architecture based on uh, reference architecture audio AI. I don't know this network. <laughs> okay, thank you. Very okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you a lot for the presentation. The next uh, Владимир Евгеньевич, можно вопрос? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Question. Question. No, no, no. К вам вопрос. К вам как организатору. In English, please. In English, please. We 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 have <coughs> what what kind of question? Uh, <coughs> Uh, again, well, uh, quick question for Vanessa. Uh, ah, so we I, uh, can answer without question. We have two speaker now, and uh, uh, we finish. Владимир uh, Евгеньевич, вы меня слышите? Okay, I see. I listen to you. Владимир Евгеньевич. Okay. <coughs> the next on this speaker is uh, Evgeny Zdarkin. Uh, first of all, scientific uh, coin is a unique decentralized research platform which should help uh, to develop projects attract necessary funds for developing and uh, it should help to investors to evaluate risk and profitability of startups before investing them. Uh, so, platform needs uh, smart contracts, such program codes, uh, that we, uh, which will organize investment pro process uh, with cryptocurrency via Ethereum's blockchain. Uh, also, use the concept of a token. Uh, each token corresponds to uh, some project. Uh, each token has a mission and its capabilities, uh, which are determined by uh, its smart contract. Uh, so, based on the needs of platform, there was formulated following goal, uh, creation and verification smart contracts, which will implement a reliable investment process uh, on the platform. Uh, the set and uh, solved list of tasks. Uh, you can see it on slide. Uh, we will touch each of them uh, in the course of presentation. 
uh, first of all, as a result of the subject um, analysis, uh, it was revealed that when users are not specialists in smart contracts. Also, the role of investor assumes the transferring and selling his tokens uh, even on the different uh, other platforms. Uh, the investment process can be carried out with different uh, conditions as the uh, real deals with stocks in the real world. Uh, the relationships between contractors uh, has a research component it is variable. Uh, after all, we have uh, logically difficult uh, programs, uh, so standard approaches and very popular now, something like testing and code analysis, don't have a required degree of reliability. So we have a lot of loses money in the history of blockchain. Uh, then there was set a list of requirements for the work. work, work. Uh, first of all, uh, the creation of smart contracts should be implemented with templates, uh, which, needs, which need uh, compat compatibility and variability. And so verification should be carried out with a uh, uh, formal method to ensure your real reliability. Uh, after that, uh, we identified uh, types of smart contracts uh, which are needed to platform. Uh, first of all, we have first type. It's uh, interactions between uh, project implementer and investors. It's a uh, smart contracts which implement token type, concept of token. Uh, and next type at the internet, it's interactions uh, between different tokens and between different investors. Something like change different types of token. Uh, smart contracts uh, were right. Um, Smart contracts were written in solid language uh, using ERC20 standard. It uh, obliged uh, smart contracts to, uh, to take uh, these six functions and two events. Uh, it uh, helped uh, ensure that uh, these smart contracts will be uh, will have interoperability with another. Uh, platforms, not only on the scientific coin, that investor can uh, sell his tokens something in another place. Is another place. Uh, what about form formal verification? Uh, the set of smart contract uh, is described by the values of uh, its variables and variables of uh, internal environment of blockchain systems at each moment of time. Uh, and this uh, this values uh, uh, depends on the sequence of called functions. So there was um, so was proposed uh, to introduce concept of a model of model of smart contract. Model is an implicit set uh, of possible values uh, of variable smart contract and internal variable of blockchain. Uh, models are uh, considered uh, corresponds uh, some limited sets uh, of timestamps. Uh, amount of timestamps is amount of uh, called functions. Um, the whole process has three, three stage. Uh, stage. First of all, we have smart contract. Uh, we have some uh, conditional on natural language. Conditional of safety, uh, they should be satisfiable on the whole uh, life cycle of smart contract. Then uh, we rewrite re a uh, model and condition in first order logic. And at the end, uh, we need to rewrite model in conditional in the syntaxis of SMT solver Z3 to check the negation of. Uh, conditionals with the limitation of model. Also, there are, we can uh, add some predicates which will uh, impose the natural conditionals of blockchain system. 
So uh, it was to mention two examples. We have two smart contacts uh, which uh, have had some vulnerabilities. First of all, uh, smart contact uh, which uh, implement the uh, escrow type uh, token. Uh, this smart contract uh, allow, allows investor to set uh, deposit rather than uh, send funds directly to the, to the owner of project. So we have uh, three conditions uh, formulated with company scientific coin and the last one uh, was it implemented. Model found uh, such sequence of function uh, which led to the way by which one uh, investor could get deposit of another one. Uh, and second smart contract is a uh, exchanging. Uh, it allows exchange different uh, tokens between different people. Uh, so you can see the um, conditional, but the model showed such sequence of function which could allow an attacker to interfere uh, in the process of exchange, uh, exchange process between two persons and get uh, tokens uh, of one of them. Uh, I will skip this slide, I will talk about it. Result. Uh, there were created uh, 10 smart contracts for scientific coin platform. Uh, was proposed a deductive uh, verification me method uh, based on the symbolic method. Uh, also, during the practical testing of the method, there were models of four smart contracts found, a fit, found and fixed two vulnerabilities and was uh, demonstrated the effectiveness of the proposed method. Um, so, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your talk, dear colleagues. Questions, please. What uh, questions? Uh, where, where do you plan to start your platform? When? 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 I, I see that you verify only four four smart co contract. Yes. Uh, uh, you have uh, ten. Of platform, uh, we need ten smart contracts. Uh, in few in months, I can uh, create model for other six, but I don't think that. So uh, one one month uh, so during one month, you uh, will verify uh, yes. the rest smart but contracts. The, uh, starting uh, of platform was delayed by uh, no, firstly it's delayed because of uh, the smart contract is not verified are not verified because it is very uh -huh. dangerous to start platform where maybe some million dollars will uh, go <laughs> okay with uh, such kind of vulnerability dear colleagues questions so, thank you, thank you for your presentation. Yes. Uh, next presentation of Ruslan Pagodin. Uh, uh, our speaker is uh, Professor Palchonov. The topic is the use of model theoretical methods for four automated knowledge extraction from medical text medical texts please professor Palchunov, are you here topic uh, is about uh, uh, processing uh, me medical texts uh, especially medical records of real patients to uh, obtain knowledge to extract knowledge from this. Well, we are based on ontologies, yes, and uh, we can see the ontological model, the, uh, the main central part of our, our construction is ontological model, 
it uh, consists of uh, domain ontology. It's main description of structure uh, meaning of domain concepts. General knowledge, uh, domain regularity, sentences which are true for every case, no domain case. The set of cases from the domain uh, which are considered in the given moment. It's uh, empirical knowledge, for example, as I said, it's uh, medical records and estimated and probabilistic knowledge. Uh, probabilistic and uh, calculation estimates fuzzy value of sentences. So we have uh, this uh, uh, ontological model, domain, ontology, general knowledge, and so on. Yes. Uh, well, and and we need to, uh, to really, in fact, we need to obtain estimated and probabilistic knowledge. And our uh, tools based on uh, model theoretical methods of uh, uh, knowledge extraction uh, from uh, natural language texts. Well, if we consider model theory, there are uh, syntactic and semantic approach, theories and models. About model, we now listen about model chicken, for example. We consider intermediate approach. We consider fragments of atomic diagrams of models. What does it mean? Atomic sentences, it's predicate of constants. Yes, or we can see the else uh, its negations. For example, love Adam if it means that Adam loves if or not love if uh, does not love Adam. Yeah, it's a very critical situation if we have its both. Uh, and we do not consider whole atomic diagram diagram because it's uh, infinite. We consider only finite fragments. And we have technique, uh, registered program system, which uh, uh, help us to uh, in, to extract knowledge from natural text as a uh, form of uh, fragments of atomic di diagrams. Well, and this uh, screenshots, yes, uh, we can, uh, well, we deal with Russian language, so it's Russian, yes. And we generate, uh, we generate a model. Uh, well, we extract information about syntax and morphology of the text, uh, predicates and uh, potential constants. Well, it's signature, and uh, construct set of logical sentences. Finally, we obtain uh, atomic sentences, and user made visual, visualize or edit the model. For example, we have. We have uh, this extracted knowledge. Yes, we can consider signature build graph. For example, if we want build graph, we, oh, excuse me. Well, uh, we, we consider this, uh, this uh, information, this predicates, terms, and so on. Yes, and if we consider signature, we have a set of signature symbols. Yes, and we can answer, ask a questions. For example, uh, uh, here you have, uh, you see example. Yes, and uh, we can consider the possible uh, answers. Well, uh, we have some, uh, have no time to speak it in details. Well, uh, but uh, very, uh, uh, very crucial point is to deal with contradictions. And uh, our aim is develop automated uh, methods for, uh, Prevention risk critical situation based on analysis of knowledge extracted from the medical histories. Yes, and if we can see the ontological model, yes, uh, uh, we need to use in domain ontology, general knowledge, domain cases, uh, extract and uh, produce estimated probabilistic knowledge. Yes, uh, uh, it uh, may consider part of clinical decision support systems. Well, uh, and our ontology represents knowledge about key concepts, uh, general knowledge uh, regulations about deci uh, decisions. Well, uh, uh, and uh, we extract it from different medical documents uh, based on precedence as its uh, medical records, uh, well, and presented as formal diagrams. And estimated knowledge uh, we uh, consider as some knowledge we can uh, uh, represent uh, in, uh, as a fuzzy uh, formulas. Yes, and it's diagrams. It's diagrams 
how the process, uh, for example, there are contradictions, process of invented risk of critical situations, process of generated estimated knowledge, yes? And it's a more, a more uh, complicated diagram, different algorithms. So we, we deal with ontology, general knowledge, precedent, estimated knowledge, and uh, uh, in, as output, we have uh, list of possible critical situations uh, and, and so on. Yes, for example, uh, some contradiction without drugs, with drugs. Yes. And I suppose my time is almost over. Yes. So, well, uh, so uh, there are some. Uh, uh, yes, examples. So thank, thank you for your attention. Possibility to ask some question. Uh, dear professor, uh, uh, please uh, explain my maybe literacy. Uh, uh, what is the difference between uh, data and knowledge? You, you title your talk as uh, automated knowledge extraction. Uh, what is the difference, for example, for, for, from automated data extraction or data mining maybe? Uh, there is some. Uh, what is the difference uh, between knowledge and data? Well, it's uh, very strong philosophical questions. It was some lecture by Pomovsky. He uh, tried to make difference between uh, data, knowledge, and information. <coughs> yes. Uh, in the frame of this consideration, uh, data is initial, initial information. For example, for example, we may consider, uh, well, uh, in the frames of uh, this consideration, Yes, uh, the fragments of atomic diagrams, uh, which are directly extracted uh, from uh, medical records, we can consider as data. Yeah, it's uh, just just uh, very small uh, facts. Yes, but when uh, after after our just well, uh, after our uh, processing, yes. For, uh, well, for example, here, uh, excuse me. Well, for example, here, yes, uh, we have data, uh, excuse me, we have knowledge. We have knowledge. We have knowledge, uh, uh, but it's estimated knowledge. And, and for example, what's the difference uh, uh, between uh, knowledge and data? Uh, if you consider general knowledge, uh, general laws, or medical, uh, which are known from medical books, for example, it's knowledge. And of course, we, uh, we proceed data, data about patients. For example, that uh, this guy has uh, such this temperature, uh, has these symptoms, has results of tests is data, yes? And we compare this, uh, this data, compare with known knowledge, about uh, illnesses, for example, and produce uh, estimated knowledge. Or we can also use known estimated knowledge, uh, prediction that this patient will, will not have, uh, have any problems and he will uh, be good in a few days, or perhaps he has a critical situation. Is that clear? Is my explanation clear? Yes, thank you, thank you a lot. Thank you. Any question? So, dear Professor Palchumno, thank you for your great talk. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your attention. Yes, uh, we are waiting for uh, next talk uh, after uh, after our uh, speaker. The next speaker is Ulyana Pavlova. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, in our work, uh, we consider some of 
classes uh, of sequences that we are trying to predict uh, using an automaton. At first, it's multilinear sequences. It can concatenate string P and S for string Q. And the second, it's real-time series that are given by unknown probability distribution. Uh, the version of the algorithm on which our work is based uses 10 read threads uh, that uh, move uh, through the sequences and uh, predict uh, further characters. This automaton is able to master any multilinear word. Uh, the, the scheme show uh, four main uh, read heads of the automaton. Uh, to completely master the string, uh, automaton will uh, alternate between two procedures, its correction and match. The correction procedure try to locate uh, four main heads um, at the beginning of the segment, uh, one after another. Uh, if it's okay, uh, then um, uh, matching procedure tries to tries to uh, master the string, assuming that the correction was successful. Matching works uh, using H1, H2, and H3 to predict H4. Uh, it moves all read heads together and uses the previous heads to predict H4. Uh, once uh, all heads are at the beginning of the next segment, matching repeats from the start. If some problem was found, for example, guess wasn't incorrect, uh, the matching procedure stops and the correction starts again. Uh, to investigate in detail the structure and scheme of the automaton, we tested them on different sequences. Uh, if the automaton detects a deviation from the multilinear sequence pattern, it starts from the beginning of the correction function. As a result, we got a significant decrease in the quality of the forecast. We decided to make some changes um, to its structure uh, to make it more suitable to work with the non-multilinear sequences. Uh, the first um, the first difference from the original model is the processing uh, of the automaton using principles of machine learning. Uh, the entire sequence is conditionally divided into training and uh, test part. This means that before starting to work directly, uh, the automaton learns on a certain number of symbols in the sequence. Next modification uh, directly affects the prediction function. Uh, uh, in the original model of the automaton, the prediction was made only in matching procedure based on the assumption that the prediction should be carried out at each movement of the rightmost uh, read head uh, of the machine. The prediction method was also added in correction procedure. Uh, next, uh, the restriction was added to automaton, which allowed uh, the function to continue, uh, to continue work only if the current uh, read heads had already passed the training stage, but did, did not reach uh, the end of the test sample. So there, a tracking method was added, designed to fix the function uh, where the forecast was called. Thanks to this, it became possible to get the number of prediction and errors uh, of each uh, individual function. Uh, when we have a complex situation, well -known, uh, a well-known method uh, based on the achiever is used for forecasting. Uh, a large number of modifications developed, applied, and tested uh, by, by us for the automaton did not significantly improve the, the quality of the forecast. Based on the hypothesis that the, it, ne it is necessary to be able to make changes uh, in the algorithm at any time, uh, it was decided to completely change the design and operation principle of the automaton. The automaton was uh, implemented in such a way that in such way that the algorithm performs, uh, it works step by step. Uh, more precisely, so uh, that the machine can stop, remember its position every time after rightmost head had been moved and uh, forecast has been made. Uh, next, we want to investigate the behavior of the automaton for other time series having a more predictable character possibly. Uh, also, we will continue to modify the automaton uh, new algorithm in attempt to improve forecast result. Moreover, we plan to add some popular prediction methods uh, in the prediction stage of our algorithm and we think it's improve the quality of the forecast. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Where is specialist on finite state automaton? Uh, so, what is uh, your possible user of your result? Who is who is your pos uh, 
possible for you. I mean, who who will use your result of practice? Anyone? Anyone? Not really. It's a uh, uh, maybe our some some example. Our binary string. You can interpret it uh, uh, on um, any. Thank you. Uh, what maybe some, uh, what, what kind of uh, some uh, use case can you provide? Can you provide some use case? Uh, the question was on the uh, which way, for example, I can use your result in, in for what purpose and what to solve what task? For, for a cast. You, the title is time series forecasting method based on finite state automata. What uh, would I want to forecast, for example? What? In the time series. Forecast? Example. example. Can you provide some example? Ah, any example for forecasting? Yeah. Uh, we, um, we use is, that there is uh, some, some talk before you for forecasting um, yeah, uh, electricity yeah. prices, yes? Yes. When we yes. tested our uh, automaton, we used uh, the dollar exchange rate. It's possible to forecast uh, the exchange rate. But, uh, and, and you insist that uh, final state automaton model is fit for any kind of object? In general, maybe not for any. I, I, what is your opinion? I think for most, but not for any. <laughs> not for any. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, colleagues, questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your talk. And our uh, the last but not least talk is uh, by Professor uh, Palchunov, please. Thank you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, Andrei Arlovsky was catched by military persons. <laughs> and at the first and second, perhaps he was so shocked that now he is ill and he can uh, speak really because of problem of voices, voice. So uh, I will uh, uh, speak about uh, this uh, our common work. Well, it's uh, it's uh, uh, well uh, the, uh, the, this work is devoted to vital assistant. What is the problem? What is the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, persons uh, wants to buy some goods uh, and. Uh, they should solve few problems. First uh, problem that the goods, for example, television, uh, smartphones, and so on, uh, should be uh, should have functionalities what they really want. Yes, what they really want, uh, and of course it's a very important price. Yes, uh, price. Uh, and there are a lot of shops. There are a lot of shops and uh, different shops. Uh, presents different goods, yes, with different functionalities and different prices. And uh, so the task of this virtual assistant uh, to help uh, to this uh, to, to, uh, uh, arbitrary guy to uh, make his, uh, well, to, 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 to buy what he wants. Well, and uh, what is specific of this approach? Uh, we uh, we we are based uh, we base our approach uh, in uh, first in uh, model of uh, uh, subject domain. It means model of uh, shops, uh, goods, properties of goods, and so on. And and what is very important, uh, model of formal dialogue and the model of the user. And uh, from my point of view, it's it is now very important. Uh, to add to add to such uh, chatbots as Alisa, Siri, and so on and so on, and a lot of bots uh, with which 
we uh, can uh, communicate when we go, for example, to bank and so on. Yes, uh, they really does not, they, they don't have model of uh, users and uh, so uh, they are a bit stupid. Yes, and there is, uh, now we can see formal description of uh, this model. Yes, we have, uh, we have steps, what is important, St states and intentions. Uh, and this uh, transition pair state intention to new state. Yes, and uh, it's from a description. Uh, I will not say a lot about it, formal description. And uh, uh, on the base of this description, we produce this uh, 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 dialogue. It's a formal dialogue model. Yes. And uh, what, uh, as, I, as I said before, what is very important, we, uh, they, uh, we take into account dialogue history. And uh, what is important, dialogue history with a given person and uh, dialogue histories with other persons who uh, can, uh, connected, conversated with this smart assistant before. Yes, and we are based in the same uh, model, but uh, uh, difference that in the previous uh, talk, uh, this model was of medical subject domain. Now model is about goods, uh, products and so on. So ontology, ontology is set of definition of different goods and its properties. Uh, general knowledge is knowledge about uh, uh, properties of these goods, for example, if we consider some wash machine or television and so on, of course, uh, properties, known properties of this uh, good, of this uh, uh, subject does not uh, depend of, uh, on uh, shops. Yes, it's general. And we have precedents. Uh, we have precedents and we can consider uh, as precedent uh, 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 or domain cases, uh, some cases of uh, conversation, uh, conversation between uh, uh, customer and our system. Yes. And we can produce probabilistic and evaluative knowledge. Well, and the uh, system has few parts. I have no, uh, a lot of time to uh, describe it in details. Dialogue manager, natural language processor, well, uh, which extract uh, uh, different entities from text uh, search engine. What, what is very important, uh, I did not uh, say uh, before, that uh, information is actual. And to, to make information actual, it's necessary to, uh, to find out this information in real websites of real shops. Uh, each each uh, each day and perhaps each time, yes. And ontology manager, uh, this uh, which use uh, use as uh, as SQL, semantic query language language uh, to uh, well uh, to deal with uh, knowledge uh, presented in ontology. Yes. So my time is over. I suppose thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, dear colleagues. Questions for a speaker? Uh, uh, my question is, uh, it's, uh, uh, in my opinion, it's very con connect connected uh, topics, kind of virtual assistant, kind, uh, kind of digital twin, kind of digital Deputy, deputy, yes. And what is the difference between these terms? Between virtual assistant, between digital twin, and between uh, digital deputy? Uh, well, uh, well. Uh, uh, in the previous talk uh, with Anna, 
we spoke uh, about the general approach uh, to, uh, to uh, this, uh, for example, issue deputies. Uh, here it's con con uh, concrete, it, uh, detailed realization for one subject domain. And a virtual assistant uh, is now, it's, it's a smart assistant, it's not, of course, the deputy because it only helps. Uh, uh, I said I said before, and it's, it's a good example about what I said before, that it uh, has no uh, self-activity. Uh, this virtual assistant only make what you want. If you ask him, uh, I want uh, such uh, good, such good, such television, such smartphone, uh, well, such wash machine on, on camera, well, uh, this assistant can help you and present your necessary information. But uh, it, uh, this assistant does not do something, something uh, uh, without uh, asking, without the demand. Yes. Other, other difference uh, is a very principal difference that this virtual assistant uh, is. Uh, provided for all uh, for all people for different people and it collects uh, information about different uh, persons and if we uh, say about uh, uh, deputy uh, digital deputy it's of course it's uh, devoted to one person yes it's uh, for one role for one given person in the hierarchy in the business processes yes and also it's a very <coughs> Principal difference, yes. And and uh, uh, this virtual uh, assistant as well has his own knowledge base, and activity. It has activity, but activity only in uh, population of this knowledge base of this ontology. Yes, thank you. Is it clear? Is my answer clear? Yes, fine, fine. Understand. Thank, thank you for uh, thank you for good question. Yeah, I have an uh, idea that we uh, may uh, uh, create some digital twin of Andrei Arlovsky and uh, add uh, some uh, virtual assistant to this digital twin of Andrei Arlovsky and encapsulate in uh, digital deputy of Andrei Arlovsky and send it to the army. Send it uh, to what? And send it instead of Andrei Arlovsky, send this digital deputy of Andrei Arlovsky, send it to Ami instead of Andrei. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it's very good idea. It's very good idea. <laughs> they say catch not uh, Arlovsky, but his digital twin. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant idea. <laughs> yes, dear colleagues, some question. So, so, dear Professor uh, <laughs> Palchinov, uh, it's uh, many thanks. Thank you a lot for your great talk. Thank you a lot. The 11th Global Mobile Broadband Forum starts now. Ready to discover how 5G innovations are creating new value for different industries? Then follow us. about to start. Let's see what the big guys from the industry are going to deliver. The mobile ecosystem is the great enabler across whole economies as we look to the future our accelerated future. We are building it together with 5G. Future. 五G的黄金十年 
besides the keynote, we also have several industry talks, including technical summits and roundtables. Follow us and stay tuned to find out more about MBBF. Uh, among the participants, I see the head of IEEE Siberian Department, and I see a representative from Siberian University of Telecommunication. Yes. And I see a triple E evangelist Grigory Romanovich Hazankin. <laughs> That's uh, uh, <laughs> please yes. Uh, thank you for Grigory Romanovich because of he in initiates this meeting. So uh, our program is uh, consists of three talks. The first talks uh Snigirova Ekaterina, are you here? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, the topic is system architecture for reading and interpreting physical printouts of medical forms. Please, five minutes for presentation. So hello, as we said, I'm Yekaterina Shnigirova, and Sam is a system architecture for reading and interpreting physical printouts of medical forms. Um, sorry. Uh, nowadays, the person most frequently cannot access his electronic medical record. Any information is often issued to the patient in an analog form, but a person can be examined in different places. When a patient comes with test results to another institution, they are manually converted back to digital format. There is also a tendency of total rejection of analog media, but over the years, a large database in analog format has accumulated and need to be transferred into a digital one. <sighs> Health information systems have become widely used uh, these days. Modern systems are already, already automating many processes of maintaining medical institutions, but they don't contain a model for automated interpretation of analog forms. Uh, described a system is intended to automate the processing and interpreting data from analog media and to transform it into a digital format without losing the accumulated base. And the next uh, examples of analog data taken is its, its ECG scans and medical test results, but the system can be extended to add new models for processing various data. Um, the development and implementation of such products as uh, described here as standalone software is difficult or even rather pointless, so we create architecture as a part of general HIS. In order for the system to be independent from the user system, is, uh, it should rep um, represent the REST architecture. Model for processing uh, different data formats shouldn't be dependent on each other, so the services can freely can be freely replaceable. Uh, adding new models for processing additional analog data does not entail changes to existing ones. Uh, the data is uploaded to the server as a scanned image via a recipe using the JSON format to the appropriate endpoint depending on the type of data. Uh, a unique identifier is loading into the system for processing also providing the ability to request results if uh, the records are not present, a message to load the data is returned. Uh, in addition to the IP for loading analog data, the basic functions for working with the patient's entity are implemented. It's create, read, modify, and delete. So in the figure, you can see the architecture. There is a REST server that uh, receive uh, receives requests from HIS in the center. You can see the models for working with different data never crossed, and new models can be added in a parallel and the IP can be expanded. Uh, the chosen examples of analog data require a different approach. 
and the ECG processing system should be divided into two parts. Uh, the first one is a clean editor. There is no way to correctly process the image without uh, doctor intervention. Uh, the biggest issue is uh, determining the position of the leads in the image, and the doctor should outline them himself. And also, uh, the digitized signal must be visualized for the user. So the second part is the service itself uh, that processes the uploaded image, produces the required calculations, and builds a conclusion. Uh, extraction data from the medical test is supposed to be carried out without doctor intervention, so there is no need for an editor. And the image is just uploaded to the server. After that, data is extracted from data classified. Uh, the received information is saved in the database and returned to the HIS. Um, the general layer between these models and the HIS works with it in the same way, and the system itself decides where to redirect one or another request. So, um, about the database, the main entity is uh, the patient. It contains fields such as ID and M and uh, identifying from the health system. On the AT ACG side, uh, there are such which contains a uh, main medical conclusion. Um, database can store many records for viewing the patient's history. Part of the record are 12 leads, each of them containing to, uh, about info about digitized signal. Uh, uh, the MT report entity was created for medical tests. It stores uh, the sample and delivery on issue date, name of the analysis and additional information. Further information for which component in the test stored uh, has uh, test name, result value, and reference values. The diagram is quite simple and allows you to build various mixed uh, queries in perspective. Um, so about the IP opportunities, uh, it goes like uh, this for the ECG. You can load a byte array with an image of an ECG signal via JSON. After it, ECG report is returned with the same data as shown in the ECG diagram, except uh, for the original image. Uh, so uh, figure above shows you the uh, example of JSON to load the original image, and uh, at the left side you can see the return paper. Uh, so uh, also the doctor can make changes to the conclusion box from the ECG editor and uh, from HIS. If desired, both uh, the signal and uh, the positions of nodes can be changed. Uh, also, it's possible to get a report one by its ID, a list report from one patient and reports um, of patient from one date uh, to another. Um, also, you can delete a report by its ID and reports are deleted when the patient is deleted. Uh, also, crude functions uh, for working with medical test um, are similar for the medical test. The ability to load uh, the byte array of the test scan is the same, has the same format as in the case of the ECG. Um, T report returns it uh, shown from the right side. You can also get uh, patient reports, all of them, or from one day to another, or specific report by its ID. You can also require reports on a specific file, uh, on a specific type of test. Uh, in addition to reports, you can get a list of components of a certain time from test. Um, the report can be completely changed at will of the doctor, and as well, uh, in the case of the ECG, you can delete report by CD, and also when you delete the patient's entity, all his reports are deleted. So, through the work and analysis of the current development of health information system was made and the possibilities of implementing such a system for digitizing and interpreting various medical analog data. As a result, the uh, architecture of the system was developed and described, including the architecture of the database and API capabilities, which can be used by HIS to automate the work with analog data. A prototype was developed that allows you to process two types of uh, data, it's called ECG images and medical test. So in the future, it's planned to make a list of what analog data uh, can 
if you choose to medicine can also be processed programmatically. Um, models for processing this data will be developed uh, prospectively over time and they be provided by the system can also be extended for the doctor's uh, decision support when making a diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. So, dear colleague, dear colleagues, question, questions, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It is really interesting. I have a short question about <clears throat> uh, state of the art. Uh, did you compare your system with uh, well-known systems? Uh, for example, uh, standards uh, HL7 fire. If I already compared it? Yes. No, unfortunately, wait. Um, okay. Still. Okay. Well, Hello, uh, my question is about uh, effectiveness of your architecture and do you estimate some uh, effectiveness of uh, your architecture uh, about what, um, what time needed to transfer one document uh, to a digital form? I'm, I'm sorry, a bad signal. Uh, hello. Uh, what about effectiveness of your architecture? Do you estimate some metrics? Uh, what time needed to transfer one document to digital format? Uh, what about some typical or maybe average uh, medical ways uh, to transfer? Uh, to mm. uh, we thought that it isn't the main uh, metrics for this system because it there is not a system which uh, have uh, the some the there is not a system with what we can compare ours so we didn't think about it and uh, also one question uh, do you um, think about uh, security of uh, data? Uh, about... uh, this uh, it is a it's a, it is a job of the HIS because it's not the system which uh, um, uh, in it it uses locally in. in What do you... <laughs> it is intranet system. What, why, no. Why? Why? why uh, what, what question was about security? I understood. Uh, but it is a local system which we used in uh, with, in the institution in their services. No, it's not internet. No, it's not, it's not internet. internet. It's oh, yes. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> other question? Other questions? Grigori? <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's your <laughs> upping hands means? Okay, yes, please. Please, one more question. Okay, thank you. Ruslan Akhvashev, Sipsutis. You said that there is no need to secure the data, uh, but what about the other doctors who also can read this data without any authorization of the patient? So I think you need some security algorithms for the data for each patient, at least to avoid other doctors to see the, re the results and analyze it. Do you mean inside one institution? Yep. Uh, maybe I don't have clear information about institutions uh, work, but I think that uh, every doctor in one uh, in one clinic now can uh, watch the patient's uh, records. They see this. It's not so ethical. Maybe I'm wrong. 
It's not so ethical for other doctors to see the results of the particular doctor. It's it's too ethical question, but I think in, that in this case it also be can be the job of HIS which uses this system um, because its um, its job is only to work with analog format of data. Uh, what what to do what to do with the with this is a decision of uh, health system. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you for your valuable remarks. It's really the point. So, other questions? Any other questions? Uh, my question is, what? Why the rest? Why rest? Why do you use uh, rest architecture? Uh. Are there, uh, there any possible uh, alternative solution or what? Or just it's, so, um, it's, it's widely used solution for such symptoms and also it has um, principles which can uh, first uh, make a single format for uploading data and uh, be and be used by any systems uh, where how they want not be dependent from HIS. Uh, do, do you uh, an analyze some uh, alternative approach, alternative techniques, alternative methods, alternative future? Uh, <coughs> No, some other architecture that can be used for the task. No, like just cloud computing. It's, uh, in my opinion, there is uh, must be a lot of alternative solution solutions. Cloud computing. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I think okay, I'll do the. So thank you for your talk. Thank you for your talk. <coughs> Dear colleagues, the next speaker, our speaker is, will be, just a minute, will be Korshunov Vadim. Вадим, are you with us? Коршунов Вадим. Окей. А вот about uh, Иван Смаль. Uh, Вадим is here, sorry. Uh, I Vadim, forgot to, to uh, turn off my mic. My, my yes. I, yes, I see. Your microphone was switched. Oh, so the next uh, speaker is Koshin of uh, uh, Vadim. Uh, the topic is development of an application for AVDE technique in effective and psychosomatic disorders treatment. Please, Vadim. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. So let's start. Uh, more and more diseases are believed to have psychosomatic nature. At first, there were about seven of them, but now there are much more. The affective disorders are quite common too, and are usually treated with uh, Jim, would you like to uh, speak a bit loudly? Oh, sorry. Affective disorders are quite common too, and are usually treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, and uh, it is effective, but the patient himself needs to put a lot of effort and it takes some time. And uh, taking the medicine like mood stabilizers, neuroleptics and uh, antidepress antidepressants uh, is a good way to go too, but in fact it is the last resort because of side effects. 
And uh, there were some attempts to create software which, be, uh, which is able to help with the treating such diseases. And the first one was called Beating the Blues. It was developed in 2004 and uh, was the one of the first media applications which could help with the cognitive and behavioral therapy. Uh, another example is a Good Days Ahead application, which is still available on the web. And such computerized cognitive uh, behavioral therapy allows to reduce the time spent on its, this therapy in twice, according to the researches uh, made by developers of such applications. But there is another way to treat affective and psychosomatic diseases. Uh, it is to use audio-visual tactile entrainment. It is based on brainwave entrainment, which uh, moves the alpha rhythm of a uh, person and helps with the many medical cases. For example, uh, it decreases night arterial blood pressure in patients with uncontrolled essential hypertension. Uh, there was a placebo control study, which was made by Aftanas at Ali in uh, 2016 at Research Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine, uh, which actually had another name four years ago. Uh, and it, also, it is also important to take into account the personal alpha peak of every particular patient, which is basically the actual frequency of alpha rhythm uh, between 8 and 13 uh, gigahertz. Uh, and uh, there are many use cases when such approach can be used, not only in hosp at hospital, but also at home or even during some sports, but without tactile stimulation. After having the therapy session complete at hospital, it is recommended for patients to continue therapies at home. Uh, so in order to be able to run a therapy, a physical device and the software are required. Uh, since patient, patients will use it at home, the control program should be available on different general purpose systems, such as uh, Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. There are some requirements uh, which the application should meet. Uh, it should uh, read and run prescribed stimulation scenarios. Scenario is a file with sequence of frequencies and durations during which this frequency should be played. It should adjust scenario according to the individual alpha peak. Each scenario was originally written for people with 10 Gerrits alpha peak, and it should be corrected. It should log the completed session so that it's easy to see history, support several user roles, so administrator can add new operators, delete them, change their passwords, and operators are, for example, doctors. Uh, it should provide the ability to independently adjust the strengths of signals of all types. Uh, it should provide real-time graphical representation of the running scenario. It should play music in parallel with stimulating signals and have an installer with all dependencies. So here is a device. Uh, it is connected to PC with a USB-A, USB-B cable and it has three outputs for light, sound, and vibration. When patient is going to have a treatment session, uh, he or she sits on a special chair with integrated Wii motors, wears headset and glasses with LEDs, and the operator or patient himself starts the session in application. But uh, there is a problem. Operating system, especially Windows, uh, often corrupts the output audio signal using some equalizers or just system sound volume. Uh, and there is a solution to use the Windows Audio Session API or Wasapi, which uh, allows you to totally control uh, output audio signal on Windows. So even if you try to change the system audio volume, when the audio signal which is played using Wasapi won't be affected. But there is another problem. Wasapi is only for Windows. So if you want to create a multi-platform program which is cheaper in development and maintenance, uh, we should decide what uh, we do. We can't just use Wasapi as it is because uh, the program won't be multi-platform. 
So another solution is to divide the program in two parts. The first part is uh, uh, operation system specific, which is specific, uh, specific for each operating system. It it just translates the signal which it uh, receives from the cross-platform interface program with the most logic so that uh, we can achieve uh, almost multi-platform application. And yes, translator program currently developed only for Windows, but the future plans is developed for Mac OS and Linux. It receives three signals, two channels each, uh, left and right, for example, for left ear and right ear, and encodes all three signals as one audio signal and sends to the device. And uh, it uh, device only receives one audio signal. And uh, before sending the signal to the device, we need to mix music and stimulation sounds uh, just by dividing them in half and uh, summarizing. So uh, as a result, after login, operator uh, enters some data of a patient or loads it with the patient's personal number. Next step is to choose the particular scenario and the alpha peak of the patient, or it can be loaded if uh, the previous session was saved. It's possible to just load all the settings. And uh, you also can uh, see history here so that you can decide which, uh, uh, which scenario to play next. Then you can select some uh, audio file to play the music and uh, on the last screen uh, which is player screen it's possible to run the scenario tune signals and uh, see the current progress and after the completion of the session uh, the prompt will ask you to save the session or to discard it if something went wrong for example well, that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, dear colleagues. Uh, question? Question? Uh, hello, Sandri Simon. Uh, my question is about uh, can you prove uh, safeness um, for health uh, for users, uh, your methods and uh, device? Uh, thank you for the question. It is not really my uh, method, I mean exactly AVT, and uh, as I said, uh, there was a research by Aftanas in 2016, and uh, he has a patent for this uh, technique, so I guess all the proofs should be there. Uh, am I right, you uh, test your device and uh, it have a good uh, effect after you finish your device and uh, some uh, proofs of the of that method that it is effective uh, I guess already exists in that uh, research but for now after I develop this uh, version of uh, application it is currently being used and tested in uh, the State uh, Research Institute of Neuroscience and uh, Medicine. Last one question. Uh, can we use your device to COVID prophylactic? Sorry, couldn't hear the last part. Uh, can we use your device and method uh, to COVID prophylactic? Well, I don't know. It's. Uh, I, I think no, but uh, who knows? I, I'm more like a developer. It's a question for those who is good at medicine. So thank you for your report. My question, have you considered splitting device into two separate blocks? One's the stimulator and second the controller. So you could, you know, avoid the issue of having to deal with different OS systems and uh, put it into only controller. Uh, you mean like having the program installed on the controller? Yes, so, uh, just a separate entity. Yes, I understood. Yes, we considered such uh, approach, 
but it uh, takes uh, more I guess money to have uh, twice as much uh, devices so if we can uh, solve this problem on a software level we would like to do it like this okay thank you question there please okay thank you Akpash Ruslan Sipsudis the first question is about the USB ports why it is so old <laughs> It's just a rhetorical question. And the second one is, which language do you use to develop this software? Uh, it's used C Sharp because uh, it's easier to uh, use IPC communication, I guess. And uh, it has some not, of course, well, you know, there is a C Sharp.net core, which uh, is a multi-platform, but it doesn't provide a API for graphical user interface, but there are some libraries which uh, allow to create a multi-platform desktop graphical application with the C Sharp .NET Core. Okay, gotcha. And the last question is about how do you plan to transform it into Linux or Mac OS, so you have to, you will have to redevelop all the codes into different language or uh, not how much time it would take to do so. Uh, in fact, ninety-five percent of uh, code, and uh, we, what is more important, the code which may uh, change in the future is this uh, cross-platform interface program, and uh, the translator program which encodes the signal and sends it to device yes we need to create a separate program for each operational system but we most likely will do it only once and it's uh, it has a smaller part of code okay okay it's fine good luck thank you thank you dear colleagues question okay that's all thank you for your talk Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, so the next uh, our speaker is <coughs> will be uh, Ivan Smal. Ivan Smal, are you here? Ivan Smal, please check your mic. Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes Ivan Smal. Uh, topic is development of framework for research of matching cooperative cognitive activity via biofeedback. Please. Can you see? Can you see presentation? Excuse me. Yes, we see you. We hear you. Please start. What? Sorry. Let me. One second, please. So we lost your slides. Yes. 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 Don't see them. Hmm. Yes, yes. Please, five minutes. We'll change. Ah, uh, okay. Uh. Okay, good evening, dear colleagues. My name is Ivan Smal. I'm a student from Novosibirsk University, and my work is about development of framework for research of matching cooperative cognitive activity via biofeedback. Sorry. <clears throat> All collaborative approach, uh, a collaborative approach to solving cognitive problems can be much more productive than working alone. But sometimes uh, 
team members may not be in harmony with each other and uh, in such situation a collaborative approach can reduce productivity can reduce productivity finding a simple method to increase the productivity of cognitive collaborative activity would have many uses nowadays ranging from science problems to ordinary household issues the research for which the software will be developed is aimed at testing some of these methods the research will consist of many experiments followed by an analysis of the data obtained in their course each experiment consists of entering information about the subjects and then passing experimental modules, mostly designed as some kind of games, <coughs> by the subjects, with obtaining the results from the modules. And there is a high chance uh, that during the course of the research, there will be a need to make edits to some experiment modules and to create additional modules. Due to the high uh, probability that changes will occur uh, and that there will be modules that solve uh, very specific tasks, it was decided to develop a framework that will allow to plug in experiment modules as separate programs and don't try to fit it uh, all in just one program. So, um, general framework uh, requirements. Uh, first is flexible settings of modules and experiment, uh, selection of mod modules, their order and input parameters in a specific experiment, ability to easily add new modules to the system, uh, unification of data obtained during experiments and ability to obtain data in a form that uh, third-party software. Mm. So, uh, use case diagrams were used to formalize requirements for this <coughs> for system. Main actors are operator, that is researcher, maybe their assistant, and subject who participate in experiments. Uh, main use cases are conducting experiments and mention data about them. We chose CSV um, format for report generation because most of programs are data uh, for data analysis can work with this format. Also, we added use cases to create experiment presets because in most uh, cases, there will be a lot of experiments with the same module settings. Um, and to make it easier and more user-friendly for operators, we added experiment presets. Also, there have to be login system to prevent uh, unauthorized access. Mm. Then a data scheme was drawn up to formalize uh, what data the system will work with. Uh, there is information about participants, such as birth date, gender, nationality, and some additional information. Important note is that the data about participants should be impersonal. Then the participant in experiment uh, is information about participant condition at the time of the experiment, for example, being in a state of intoxication or the presence of uh, recent head injuries and etc. Mm, this information is important because there will be experimental modules with EEG based BF feedback and information about uh, head injuries, gender, nationality, etc. would be helpful in subsequent data analysis. Then module in experiment is information about particular experimental module in particular experiment. It contains its input values, its output or result values, uh, module order in experiment, module name, and time of start and finish of module work. And finally, experiment information that <coughs> has all required information about experiment. Mm -hmm. then, mm, then it's necessary to design the system architecture based on uh, requirements. System will work with research data, so it may be not uh, correct to store data just on the hard disk of a uh, laboratory's computer, because if something happens to the computer, the data may be lost. Therefore, the most uh, suitable option is to store data on, in database uh, with each located on failover hardware, pl hardware platform. We also decided to make a web application for operator work uh, that is working with all information and systems as very poor generation, etc. Uh, thus, operators will be able to work with data not only from their laboratory, but also from their home or even on portable devices, which can be useful, especially with the uh, current uh, epidemiological situation. So, um, you can see final architecture on diagram. There are four components. Database, uh, web application, PC, um, Windows application to control experimental process, that is login and register participants and working with experimental modules uh, using name, named pipes and the web service with uh, RESTful API to organize data flow from Windows application to database. And also you can see Alpha S uh, module named pipes API, which uh, system provides to ex experimental modules. Hmm. 
For formalization of component requirements, we use to use case <coughs> diagrams for each component, uh, activity diagrams for each use case, and two API documentations, uh, uh, web service API and uh, API for experimental modules. So, uh, uh, next to use technologies. Uh, uh, we used MongoDB database, that is NoSQL database, which was important because there is a chance that there will be changes to data scheme and uh, handling it with, uh, with NoSQL database would be much easier than with SQL database. Uh, also, we used uh, ASP.NET MVC framework for net application and web, uh, web application and web service and the Unity for Windows application. Um, as a result of the work, uh, system requirements were drawn up based on the research needs, uh, system architecture was designed, and the system that uh, fully meets the requirements uh, was developed. An explanatory experiment module uh, that uses the system API has also been implemented. Its source code with comments is in free access on GitHub. And so following work can consist of uh, maintenance of software in the research process, adaptation of the software to other research, and working on experimental modules. Thank you for your attention. I would be yes, glad to answer questions. Talk. Thank you for your talk. Colleagues, dear yeah, colleagues, question please. My, my question is uh, about, is it possible to look at the use case mm -hmm. diagram? And yeah, yeah. Diagram? Is it possible? Yes. Uh, just second, please. Quite like strange that you announce that you use use case diagram, but but that's what. Oh, uh, use case diagrams for components or what? What use case diagram for your software? Yeah, that is. Ah, this is. Yes. Ah, uh, please uh, some comment on the. Of the picture, Ad administrator. Where, where is your uh, users that uh, that demonstrate the collaborative activity or what? Well, collaborative activity is uh, in experimental modules uh, themselves. Uh, Sub that subject. I yeah subject. yeah yeah subject is participant in experiment. With whom he tried to. Mm, so, uh, there will be multi multiple subjects, now two, <laughs> uh, for each uh, experiment. Okay. So, subjects would collaborate with uh, on one another. Okay, okay, thank you. Colleagues, question, please. So, have you tested the scalability of your system? No, sorry, I, I can't hear you. Can you please? Uh, so, uh, have you tested the scalability of your system so it can be used for more subjects? Uh, no, no. Uh, in uh, this research, uh, they are playing all, only about two subjects. So scalability on this direction is not uh, is not like, implemented. And what is uh, the c current state of your software? Is it just mm. a prototype, or maybe someone already used it? Mm. No, it is not in use right now. But uh, yeah, it's uh, like a prototype. But uh, maybe it needs some. Mm. Mm, some additional work, but not much, and... Uh, some, some additional uh, work, uh, would you like to be more... Mm. Yeah, just maybe... Um, well, it's uh, all the requirements that are standard there, uh, that are stated there, are implemented, mm. and like... Uh, it uh, can be mm, well. It can be put into work right now, but uh, as I said, there are 
maybe there will be some changes during uh, the research. Okay, thank you. Dear colleagues, question, question, please. Okay, hello. You told that you used the REST API to transmit the data between the functions or services. And in, in what way the data is transmitted? For example, do some subscribe and notify service or each function just sending the requests and getting the answer? Mm, mm, just wait a bit. So uh, API is between uh, Windows application and uh, web and database. Uh, so I think I don't understand your question. Can you please? You know, for example, some part of this application just sending a request to a database and database sending the answer or at some time, the database, you know, in some period of time, will just update the data, how it's done in your work or will be done. Because this, is, this part for REST API is quite important since, for example, in 5G, it is used commonly and this part as the subscribe and notify and request and answer also is kind of useful, useful thing for data transmission between those functions. Mm. Okay, so we didn't think mm. about it. It's no, no problem. Yeah, maybe I didn't think, but maybe I didn't fully understand the question. Okay, maybe one more question. Uh, please, uh, uh, in light, uh, me, uh, why why do you need two actors uh, in your system? In, in, I, my, I mean that, uh, in my opinion, there is some kind of unpredictability when you use two actor to define uh, cooperative effectivity. Well, two subjects, you mean, yeah? Yes, two subjects. Yes, two subjects. Why not mm. subject and, uh, for example, digital twin of uh, other subject? Just a uh, final state of home. Oh, some model of the uh, subject that imitate. Mm, yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand your question. Well, because the whole point of research is to. Um, mm, is to find out uh, can we like uh, increase the productivity of uh, uh, cooperative work between two people via um, BA feedback. Well, it means that uh, just uh, idea of research check this. So, so you try to research individual uh, co co cooperative cooperative activity between two, two yeah between two individuals three person it's not just no cooperative ability there is uh, mm. some person for example uh, big five model uh, give you answer a question uh, uh, big five give you answer uh, is this concrete person uh, has uh, co co cooperative uh, cognitive ability or not. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I mean that, uh, I mean that uh, you, it seems to me, it sounds uh, for me like you try to understand uh, is this two person fit to each other or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Ah, yes. The, the main goal is to understand uh, you have two person, and uh, the question is: Is these two person fitted? For, for example, in uh, some uh, marriage. In some work, in yes. The, <laughs> the, yes. Yes. Man, man, and uh, woman, and 
the question is, uh, is it uh, wisdom to marry, it? for example, yes? Yes, it's not yes, just about man and woman, but yes. such kind of situation, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, some question. So, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you, uh, thank you for your questions. <coughs> so, dear colleagues, uh, uh, our session is finished now. So, thank you all participants for the for your partic <laughs> for <laughs> so, uh, that you take a part in our uh, uh, extra session and also uh, i personally would like to say thanks for sponsors uh, for our mason uh, <laughs> for for firstly for huawei Firstly, for IEEE session and uh, other sponsors that uh, support our activity in this great direction. So, thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Five G is coming for a super connected world. The car industry is one of the first verticals to take advantage of cutting edge five G solution for improving road safety. Huawei is spending significant efforts to bring 5G into the car industry. In June 2017, China Mobile, Saika Motor and Huawei have jointly conducted the first field trial in China for tele-operated driving. The tests took place in Shanghai, powered by 5G, ultra-high bandwidth and ultra-low latency. A person sitting miles away from the car can remotely and easily drive the car as precisely as he would be in the driving seat. With 50 megs per second uplink throughput, the multi-HD video data coming from the car can be transmitted to the driver immediately, while the control signals from the remote driver can also be transmitted back to the car under 10 milliseconds. The driver seems sitting in the car to drive it like people do today. Applications for teleoperated driving could be applied to dangerous environments like mining and construction fields. There are other scenarios where teleoperated can play a major role, such as car rental and car sharing projects. In June 2017, Huawei has also conducted platooning trial in Germany and in China. With 5G ultra low latency, the control signals can be transmitted from the pilot car to the following cars within 5 milliseconds. It allows the platooning fleet to manage all events such as the close tracking, the lane change, and the emergency brake easily thanks to the precise synchronization among all vehicles forming the platooning fleet. Such a scenario will improve the road safety, save labor cost, and lower the fuel consumption by shortening the distance between platooning vehicles. Recently, in Beijing and Shanghai field trials, Huawei has completed a series of 5G new radio tests. The downlink peak throughput has reached over 6 gigabytes per second for a single user. The cell peak rate has exceeded 18 gigabytes per second. Moreover, these field trials have demonstrated that the 5G NR air interface latency is well below 0.5 milliseconds, and the total cell capacity can support over 4 million single cell connections. Let's move forward to a more connected and intelligent world enabled by 5G.